Buenos dias, everyone. Good morning. I'm really thankful that we're here today, here at the City Council in the committee room. Uh, my name is Carlos Menchaca. I'm the chair of the New York City Council's Committee on Immigration. And I would like to thank my colleague, Chairperson Debbie Rose of the Committee on Youth Services uh, for making this joint hearing possible. Uh, and I, I would also like to thank the members of the Immigration Committee who are here from Queens, Councilmember Holden, uh, from Brooklyn, uh, Councilmember Eugene. And uh, we also have Councilmember Margaret Chin here as well. Today our committees will be hearing testimony on the realities that the LGBTQ immigrant youth face in New York City. Even though New York City is a sanctuary city, and we fight every day to ensure that we keep to that promise, we have some of the strongest anti-discrimination laws in the country. LGBT immigrant youth continue to face unique challenges and barriers when it comes to housing, education, healthcare, and economic opportunities. There have been a lot of discussions and conversations in the news lately about immigration policies in the United States and the impact that these policies have on individuals and families. But the LGBTQ immigrant youth are almost never part of that conversation. They keep getting left behind. Part of the reason is because data on the number of immigrant youth who identify as LGBTQ does not exist. So I am very proud that today we are recognizing this population and thinking about how we as a city, as a whole city, every city agency, every public official, all of us can better serve them. The LGBTQ immigrant youth face challenges that all youth and LGBTQ youth face, but they also often fall through the cracks of a system due to the flaws in our US immigration system. This makes them one of the most vulnerable populations. For example, the LGBTQ immigrant youth are disproportionately represented in the unaccompanied minor population in the United States, making up 19% of immigrant children in foster care. Unaccompanied LGBTQ children account for 12 to 15% of immigrant children in the juvenile justice system, and 40% of the homeless youth population. 40%, that's unacceptable. A survey of runaway homeless youth in New York estimates that each night a minimum of 3,800 youth are homeless, more than half of whom identify as LGBTQ, and about 15% of whom were born outside the U.S. Many LGBTQ immigrant youth are undocumented and qualify for immigration legal services. And it's important that we connect them to those services so that they can get a path to citizenship and access necessities such as health care. And I am proud of my colleague, Councilmember Daniel Drum, for introducing legislation to help connect runaway and homeless youth who qualify for special immigrant juvenile status with services. I fully support intro number 480. And I am proud that my colleagues, Councilmember Drum and Rose, for their leadership on this issue. Because of this intersecting issues, uh, area of a very vulnerable population that the LGBTQ immigrant face, uh, immigrant youth face, it is imperative that city agencies, all of them, coordinate to ensure access to critical programs and services for this vulnerable population. As chair of the Immigration Committee, I am particularly interested in hearing from the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs about their efforts to coordinate with other city agencies in serving the LGBTQ immigrant youth community. This includes updates on the Moya-led interagency task force, which we passed by law last year, which is mandated by Local Law 185, uh, but we understand it hasn't really convened, and we want to understand what is happening with this task force, in particular to today's discussion. We look forward to hearing testimony today from the Department of Youth and Community Development the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, NYC Unity Project, and advocates on how the city is serving the LGBTQ immigrant youth and how we can do better. In the preparation for this hearing, I want to thank my senior advisor, Cesar Vargas, my chief of staff, Soshi Adam Meng, communications director, Tony Chiarito, 
and the whole committee staff. Uh, this is committee counsel Harbani Ahuja, committee policy analyst Elizabeth Cronk, finance analyst Jin Lee. Uh, Chair Rose will be making her opening statement a little later. And to kick us off, and to really set the tone, uh, we're going to have Eve Stotland from the door. Please come to, uh, uh, to the bench and speak to us and really kind of give us a sense about what we're de dealing with here in the city. And as you come up, I want to thank uh, Council Member Drum and to deliver his statement, if you would like, uh, on 480 which we're really proud to have and hearing today. Thank you, please. Uh, thank you, Chairman Chaka, and good morning, and thank you, uh, and Chair and, and Councilmember Rose for hearing um, intro 480 and for your steadfast support for the city's immigrant communities. In 2010, the council passed legislation that I introduced to improve how the Administration for Children's Services dealt with immigrant children in its custody. Specifically, there was the concern that young people were aging out of the system before getting the opportunity to apply for Special Immigrant Juvenile Status, or SIGS. This is a form of, of immigration relief that allows certain qualified undocumented children and youth to become permanent residents of the United States. Intro 480's purpose is analogous with Local Law 6 of 2010, but focuses instead on undocumented immigrant homeless and runaway youth in the care of or in contact with runaway and homeless youth providers and the Department of Youth and Community Development. The department should be identifying SIGS eligible youth and assisting them in obtaining immigration relief. These young folks are often left without a voice due to their undocumented status and that is only exacerbated when they are without a home or support. Fortunately, there are advocates, some of whom are here today, working to ensure that these New Yorkers do not continue to go unheard. Intro 480 would require the department, along with other runaway and homeless youth providers, to establish a plan on how to identify and serve this community. The legislation calls for the plan to include a description of the department's current policies and training programs, as well as a plan to identify these young people and to coordinate services for them, among other things. Today, we look forward to hearing testimony from the department and runaway and homeless youth providers and how they currently serve this community on a daily basis. We also look forward to hearing from immigrant and child welfare advocates on what happens on the day-to-day -day basis, what is working in the department, and what it needs to be improved. I look forward to hearing from all the witnesses about how the New York City uh, can better serve immigrant, runaway, and homeless youth. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Councilmember Drum. And I'm Ms. Eve Stotland. Take it away. Uh, it's supposed to be red. Red is good. Okay. Yes, it's red. Uh, good morning, everyone. My name is Eve Stotland. I'm the Director of Legal Services at the DORA Center for Alternatives, a youth development center serving about 10,000 young people, uh, New Yorkers at risk, ages 12 to 21 each year. Uh, thank you so much to Chairperson Rose, to Chairperson Menchaca, to the introducer of this bill, uh, Councilmember Drum, and to the Committees on Youth and the Committees on Immigration for bringing this very important issue um, to the forefront. As we all know, immigrants are under attack in the city and across the nation. And New York City uh, has been and remains a model nationally, perhaps internationally, for best practices in keeping our communities and uh, uh, vulnerable populations safe. In all of this action, trying to cover so many fronts um, uh, with immigrants under attack in new ways, each day, each week, I read the paper, we read the paper, uh-oh, another problem today to deal with on the ground. Um, I do believe that um, the population or the sort of constellation of populations, undocumented youth, undocumented youth who are LGBTQ, which highly correlates with undocumented youth who are homeless or at risk of homelessness, can be forgotten. Um, at the door, it's never forgotten. That is a core population that we serve and have served for many years with the city's uh, tremendous support. Um, 
We have both a drop-in RHY program, an outreach program, and a legal services program, all of which receive um, generous support from the city and other sources. Um, nevertheless, as uh, intro number 480 indicates, there is more that can be done. Um, so the door, um, and I also uh, speak on behalf today of um, the Peter Chikino Youth Project at Urban Justice Center, uh, who regret that they couldn't send a representative, um, which does similar work to the door um, with this population. Um, we support intro number 80, and I'd like to just raise a few um, ways that I think um, we could make it even stronger. Um, and this is not in any way critical. The, things are changing so quickly on the ground that if you'd asked me for my opinion or my reaction to this bill a year ago, it would be different than today. So uh, thank you for asking me my opinion. Okay, so uh, first of all, um, we gotta move beyond special immigrant juvenile status. Special immigrant juvenile status is a very powerful, important tool for getting immigration relief, meaning a green card, lawful status, um, to children who have been abused, neglected, and abandoned. However, like many uh, paths to lawful residence, it is under attack by the federal government. And I have details in my written testimony. Um, I don't want to bore people with some very technical um, information, but, uh, the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Service has started to deny correctly filed applications for children who are unquestionably eligible for special immigrant juvenile status. In my office alone, we have seen received over 10 denials over the past year. Um, and this is particularly true that they are denying cases for children who became dependent on the family court order, uh, became dependent on the family court or received an order from the family court when they were 18, 19, or 20. New York is a very special state. We allow um, family court jurisdiction both in foster care proceedings and in guardianship proceedings until turn, children turn 21. This is because we recognize in New York that most 19 year olds are not ready to be on their own. Um, it's hard for any of us to make our rent. Most 19 year olds are not ready to just go out there and pay market rent, for example. Um, so we have family court jurisdiction until 21 and uh, USCIS, the federal government is saying, no, you don't. This is outrageous. Uh, there is no situation under which a federal bureaucracy should be telling the New York State Legislature and New York State Family Court judges what they do and don't have jurisdiction over. Um, Legal Aid Society, together with Latham and Watkins, has filed a class action lawsuit. All of this is to say we need to move beyond SIGE, and so I would be very glad to see the language broadened, and there is some broader language in there, but more explicitly to say that we want young people who are LGBTQ and or in the homeless youth system to be screened, to receive a comprehensive immigration screening for any immigration relief any path to a green card that they might be eligible for. Paths that I know that this committee is very familiar with that are worth mentioning include asylum, U visas, T visas, sometimes even an older uh, sibling who's a US citizen who might be able to sponsor them, right? We wanna look at every opportunity because um, an opportunity that's available one day under the Trump administration, the next week it's not available anymore. So that's um, the first request. The second request is just that the bill contemplate also exploring access to full representation. Screening is absolutely the first step. If young people don't know that there's anything they can do about their undocumented status, they're not gonna do anything about it. Um, so that's very important. Once they find out, for example, that they're eligible for SIG, SIG is just really, uh, I do not say this because I'm a lawyer, I am a lawyer, but uh, SIG is really not something that a young person can obtain on their own. They, they really need a lawyer. They need to go to family court, they need to then file something and get a very specific kind of order. They then need to file applications with the US Citizenship and Immigration Services um, under the current administration um, 
applications are being rejected uh, or there's requests for more information, there's requests for more evidence, they keep putting up hurdles. It's not, it was never an easy system for a person to navigate without an attorney now. I'd say it's really impossible. Um, so if we could include some language um, in, that would ask DYCD to also look about at what would it require for all the children who receive this screening are found to be undocumented but eligible for relief to actually get a free attorney. That would be a terrific step forward. Um, I want to thank the city and the city council for the funding that the DORA and other service providers already received to do this work, but I am sorry to say that even with that funding, we do turn, the door does turn away and other providers do turn away young people who may be eligible for relief because we are at capacity. That is something that happens and we would like that, I know everyone in this room would like that to not happen. Every homeless or LGBTQ young person uh, who is eligible for immigration relief should be able to get a free attorney so that they can make a successful transition to adulthood. So thank you so much. Uh, I'm always proud when I think about these issues to be a New Yorker and to be a partner with the city council and the city on these issues. Thank you for not just the analysis, but the recommendations. Uh, I'm gonna uh, ask uh, the uh, sponsor of the bill to maybe, maybe further ask questions on that front, and I'm gonna hold my questions for you and uh, give it over to I'm going to think account. aloud, which may be dangerous to do in a hearing, <laughs> but um, I Please. hear you on the complete screening. Um, I think that that is um, very necessary. Um, some of the issues that we have had in the past, as you mentioned as well, is that um, oftentimes youth do not have any idea of what type of relief may be available to them. And I think the problem is worse when you're talking about LGBT youth as well, because um, you know, um, either oftentimes it's overlooked by providers mm -hmm. um, and not just DYCD, actually other um, institutions, uh, legal services as well. Um, and so um, part of the, the, of the reason that makes that a little bit complicated is because people sometimes often feel uncomfortable, mm -hmm. rightfully or wrongfully, asking particularly about LGBTQ uh, identification. And so, uh, that is something that we are thinking somewhat about, um, just have not come up completely with the, the answer to that. But, um, you know, I um, did have an experience um, in my office early on, right after we passed the initial piece of legislation, I think it was, where I had a former student, I was a New York City public school teacher for 25 years before I got elected to the council, and a student came in and um, he was um, 17 years old, it was being thrown out of the home. Uh, his mother found out that he was gay, and actually the mother was okay with me uh, being gay, but um, not with him. So that's a whole other layer of issues there. Um, but um, he came to the office, closed the door, told me that he was gay, and told me that um, he was undocumented. Um, so that, that student was applying for asylum. Um, he did was lucky enough to be able to find out that um, that might be a possibility for him, but it became even more complicated when um, judges uh, questioned um, you know, his time in the country, because you're only eligible for asylum, I think, for a year after you come. Um, but he didn't know that he was gay until he was like 16. So fortunately for him, though, in this case, we were able to get him housing in Queensboro, in Queens College, mm -hmm. where they do have a dormitory, and his case worked out well. But these are the types of cases that we see very often, actually, especially in the LGBT community. Mm -hmm. So that's my, my spiel on this, and um, I appreciate your testimony. Um, I have more questions, actually, for the administration. Are they coming? Okay, you just did it this way today? Yeah, okay, so that we would hear from the advocates first? Yeah, okay, I know that's your style. And uh, I do appreciate that. So we'll continue to talk on this, and we definitely appreciate the, the suggestions. Absolutely, and I appreciate you um, bringing up the issue of schools or high school students. Um, we have found at the door that um, many high schools are receptive, need information, and so um, we believe that this, the schools, especially high schools, are an important um, part of getting this message out as well. Mm -hmm. 
And I'll be asking this of the other advocates in the other panels, but the, the kind of two, uh, the two things that you brought up were relating to funding and capacity. And, and so can you speak a little to that uh, uh, further than your testimony gave us, a sense of, of dollars and need and how, how you feel the city can do better to bring more resources. And then the, the other piece that uh, we spoke to at the ICE hearing was relating to ICE presence, mm -hmm. uh, specifically in, the, in their enforcement in areas and how that impacts the LGBT communi LGBTQ community specifically. So those two points, if you can speak to. And I will say that we have two youth uh, who are uh, here and want to tell their story, and I want to have them speak next before the administration. Sure, so uh, on the issue of funding, I think it's important, I believe everybody on this committee understands, but there may be other city council members or people in the administration who don't, that, NIF, for example, NIFAP, um, our, the city's groundbreaking program to provide counsel for detained immigrants in deportation proceedings, and I care, the city's groundbreaking <laughs> program to, to provide representation to children um, in removal proceedings are, again, amazing programs. We participate in one of them at the door. However, they don't quite get at this issue. Many of the children we see who are LGBTQ, for example, the young man that a uh, council member Drum saw in his office was not in removal proceedings. And so it's just important for people to understand that while those programs are uh, beyond reproach, um, they don't get to this particular population. Um, and so to the extent that we really want to do something as a city for this population, it's not going to be through those programs. It's going to be through another program. The existing program that I'm most aware of is um, a program that the door uh, is a contractor on, which is um, used to be DYCD, H uh, CSBG, it's a community service block grant program. Now the contract has been transferred to HRA, um, and uh, it's a terrific contract that is very specifically for immigrant youth. You have to be under 20. I can't serve a 22-year-old in this part, right? This is money that has been earmarked and dedicated to young people, right? Um, and generally, young people who are not in removal proceedings, but are often homeless, LGBTQ, in foster care. Um, it's an amazing program. The funds for that program have not grown over the period um, that I'm aware of. Um, that's probably because they're federal funds. Uh, but anything that we could do to enhance that program, it's a great program. Um, but again, it could use to grow. And I also want to bring up a, a difficult point. Um, under the Trump administration, as an immigration lawyer, it takes me more hours to do a case. Uh, cases have become more resource intensive. And this puts me as a program manager and an advocate in an awkward position of asking for the same amount of money or sometimes more money to serve fewer people. And I understand that that is, um, you know, that's not like what you want to hear from a salesperson, right? Why, why wouldn't you like to buy one banana? It used to cost you $3 uh, for, for eight bananas. Now it's going to cost you $3 for two bananas. <laughs> I, I understand that's a hard sell. But I also really think that uh, you all are reading the news and you understand that that's not because of any failure in our service or any desire by us to serve fewer youth, but because the administration is, uh, the Trump administration is dead set on making it as hard to get every single green card as possible. And zealous advocacy, now a case might have taken us 40 hours and now it takes us 80 hours. And we're not going to stop representing that kid, but as it takes us 80 hours, we would have usually taken another case, and we can't. And this is something that we see throughout um, the legal providers world. Um, so I don't have an answer for that, but I do want to bring it up and ask for your continued support as um, the federal government very intentionally wants to make it more expensive to prevent people from um, being deported or to get people green cards. Uh. Thank you so much for, for this. And you've identified some gaps. Some of them we've kind of understood and know and will be part and have been part of our negotiations with this administration to ensure that every New Yorker gets the right kind of representation. Right. 
not just in the gaps, but the amount uh, as they increase, not just the cost of a case, but the cost of bail, the cost of all these things that are going up to make it more difficult. And the city has to make a decision whether this is a population worth investing in or not. Uh, and I think that's what this conversation is all about today. So thank you so much for your time and thank you for everything that you and the door do to serve our immigrant LGBTQ youth. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you. We're gonna call up the youth, the two youth uh, who've come and uh, want and need to tell their story. Uh, the first youth, or the two youth are Sky, O'Neill, Adrian. If you could come up, please, uh, and sit, sit in front of us here. And uh, Naashriel Akil Bishop, please, come on up. And I wanna say thank you again on behalf of the city council and and everyone that is here to listen to you uh, for your for your testimony today. Good morning, and thank you for having us. It's Jahas Rialakel. Uh, thank you, and you said my name correct, Sky Adrian. Thank you. Okay, I just I'll just go. Um, so yeah, my name is Sky Adrian. I'm 22 years old. I'm a Jamaican gay black man. I immigrated here in February 2015 in fear persecution of, because of my sexuality. Um, I currently act as a co-chair of New York City's Continuum of Care Youth Action Board. Um, and I just want to thank everyone for putting this on and giving me this opportunity. Um, so I've had many experiences living in New York, um, but the most challenging has been my immigration proceeding. Uh, back in September 2015, I had found the Alifourni Center where I had received legal support via urban justice, um, intensive case management, housing, healthcare, and a host of other referral services. However, even though I did everything right three years later, I am still stuck with an alien status confined to the fine print. But um, even in that moment, I identified a few challenges that were a little bit more apparent, not just to myself, but other young people in the same situation were going through those. And some of those were, um, and this is in reference to the SIDGE process. So that's seeking a willing and suitable guardian to assist with the SIDGE process. And for those who don't understand what that means, is that for you to be emancipated, you have to find another guardian who's gonna replace the guardian that you're trying to, um, emancipate yourself from. So because DYCD does not allow providers to do the sign off as that guardian, that's an immediate challenge if it is that you are coming from another country and you're not too sure who it is that you can ask. And then it's also a legal liability, so it's not very easy to convince someone to do something of that nature without some kind of exchange that may be unsolicited. Um, despite there being a time gap for the process, which is ideally six months, um, it tends to take longer, it tends to take a longer time and delay like other processes. And that's an immediate response to wherever it is that you are. As a young person experiencing homelessness, you may not necessarily have a stable address and therefore it's harder for you to prove which court your case would be heard in because you have no address. And DYCD providers, only just maybe a few of them allow you to use their mailing address services, but others don't. So if it is that you're not eligible for their services to be able to get that access, then it's hard for you to prove an address. Um, as a part of the SIDGE process, notification must be made to your legal guardian that you're seeking guardianship from someone else if they're not capable of caring for you or are not in the United States. Now, many youth experiencing homelessness have very strained relationships with their guardians and requesting that they sign this form can cause additional tension. Um, and I think what is also not thought about in this process is when this notification needs to be sent intentionally, which was my situation, the postal system differs very much in other countries, so it can cause significant like barriers in individuals receiving the form and signing it and returning it to you in a timely manner. Um, the next apparent, and, and this is what I think everybody's been speaking about, is many runaway homeless youth providers do not like have funding allocations for immigration related fees if a young person cannot prove their ability to pay the fees. So my situation now, like coming up, is the work authorization. Ideally before, if it is that I can't prove that I have Medicaid, I would now have to pay $410 until it is that um, I actually get a response from immigration office. 
Um, and that's a fee, even though I may be able, or the system shows that I may be able to pay it, I'm still within the runaway homeless youth um, jurisdiction, so I'm not too sure why it is that you're not eligible if you can't prove Medicaid. Um, so that was like another issue. And then many young people with lived experiences of homelessness, as I mentioned before, like myself, do not have a stable and consistent address. Um, so therefore, that may affect what course you may be heard in. Like say, for instance, we all know that if you're heard in the Bronx or if you have a Bronx court, that takes like even years just to be heard because of like, you know, the backup that's associated with that particular court in question. However, um, I'm not a person to come in and just state my problems. Like, I also, like, force resolutions or recommendations that I think could be helpful to the process. So I also believe that DYCD providers should provision their site to receive mail for young people that they receive service. That's not something that's mandated, and I think that's something that needs to be taken into account, um, because we are, they are young people within that particular age group or within that particular community are like in this space for 30 days or more, so ideally you should provide that kind of service. Um, runaway homeless youth providers must support youth in identifying any possible individual that could act as guardians for the application. In addition, if youth do not have potential guardians available to them, providers need to explore other immigration options that they may qualify for. Because I did not know about SIG until maybe two to three lines down in the process. Um, and of course, again, allocating additional funding to assist young people with legal fees that cannot be waived. And then SIG process should take six months or less to be completed. I think that DYCD also needs to assist with the tracking of that process whenever the case becomes too drawn out. Um, and that concludes my recommendation. Thank you. Thank you for that. Not just the analysis and the feedback and also for the solutions and possible ways that we can work together. And one of them I want to underscore is the, the additional funding that keeps coming up, but we gotta keep saying it or else it doesn't happen. And then really thinking about the Department of um, Homeless Services, DHS, and thinking about that address thing more and how we can, as a city agency, uh, response, as a city response with its agencies can can really focus on that one one piece. Thank you. You're most welcome. Thank you. Um, good morning again. So my name's Jahasriel Akel Bishop. Uh, I use they, them pronouns. I am 22 years of age. I am from Guyana. Uh, I identify as Afro-Guyanese. Uh, I migrated to New York City on July 4th, 2016. So it was a special day. Uh, <laughs> I'm currently a student at the Warren of Manhattan Community College and serve as an executive member to the New York City COC Youth Action Board, lead of the training and development. Um, similarly, I have um, had some of the same challenges. However, my asylum case is affirmative, so I'm an affirm affirmative asylum applicant. Um, but in my time being here, my struggles have been supporting myself because I don't have a, like a, a family or a family circle. And so, for a long time until I did get my work permit, I was basically depending on, I guess, program stipends and like friends and and just people in general, which put me at risk for a lot of things or like, you know, a lot of risky um, in involvement. And so I think those were some of my challenges early on. Um, it's still very challenging coming from another country and not having, I guess, work experience that um, a lot of employers in New York City are looking for just coming from a different culture, uh, which has also been a challenge in like, you know, finding and securing jobs. But also the biggest thing is when, it, when I first came, wanting to go to school, but not meeting the requirement or having like the financial support to do that um, and spending a lot of that time just wondering and from hopping from program to program. And so I think my recommendations are similar to Sky, but also um, I guess increased funding for academic support, especially for immigrant youths who are coming into the country who can't work, but might be able to go to school during that gap while they're here waiting for status. I think that would be really helpful for anyone looking to start over, um, wanting to start over and building a, a better and brighter future for themselves. And I think that's really the, the most of it. Like I'm very like passionate about education and I know and I've seen how impactful it is for a young person in New York City to have uh, an associate's degree or a bachelor's degree, um, especially if they're trying to build a career or get employed. And so I think that's like really important. Thank you for your testimony, and uh, and I think not just the education piece, but 
really thinking about how how we bring more more awareness so that people can feel empowered at moving through the system is is key in, in every way. I'm gonna hold my questions and hand it over to Councilmember Drum uh, to ask a few questions of, of both of you. Thank you. Um, I have a question for you actually, which I didn't get to ask uh, before we switched over. Um, how did you um, get pointed in the right direction for services? How did that happen? Um, so originally when I came here and I met like other young people that were in the same situation before having gone to California Center, the resolution that they gave me was to go online to find other men to host me at that time. Um, and I just didn't feel like that was the only option. I felt like there was more. So when I looked online, the first place that popped up was the California Center. Um, and that's how I was pointed to that service. What was the what? I'm sorry, it's a little hard for me to hear. Oh. What center? The California Center. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I had found them, I, I found them online and that's how I'd gotten connected to their services and then they connected me to other services that they work with. So that's LGBT identified, right? Yeah, that's LGBTQ right. identified. So that component of it, that aspect of um, it, you already knew that you were LGBT. Yes. That's so correct. that wasn't a, an issue for you to deal with looking for the services at the same time for immigrant services? Yeah, no. So when I, because um, I looked at a few of the shelters and that was the only one that explicitly stated that it was LGBTQ identified. So then I felt a lot more safe in that space as opposed to going to somewhere else that wasn't like particular to that community. And how old were you? I was 18 turning 19 at the time. Um, and do, do you hear stories from other LGBT youth about the difficulty of finding or accessing services? I mean, maybe now that you know what to do, you refer people or, but do you know of other young people um, that just don't know where to turn to? Yeah, because I think it, 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 it gets a little bit more, even though there's so many services that, that, that are around, it gets very complicated to navigate that because even though they may serve the same community and you say the same people in the spaces, like a lot of them have different operational hours, a lot of them have public access or by appointment access, and that's information that regardless of how you communicate that, that doesn't stay stable. So it's very difficult for you to find somewhere if it is that you already are not aware of the system. I was just an individual that, okay, like I knew that this particular place closed at one time and then this would open at another. So I was able to like transition rather quickly, but for someone who's just coming and not, or maybe someone's not, that's not in the same mental capacity as I am, are gonna have like several challenges trying to navigate what that looks like. Have you ever heard of the New York City Unity Project? Ah, yes, um, three of my board members were featured in that project. Okay, do you know of other youth that have heard of it? Yes, that's correct. Do you feel that the program is effective? Uh, yeah, I definitely, like we've been working um, very extensively with um, DUS, um, DUICDs um, and, and, and the Unity Project. Um, the only recommendation, we had some recommendations around the messaging um, and they took, they received that really well and then we also recommend that they create like a youth advisory board or just to ensure that young people are informing their conversations after this project has been launched and they've been forthcoming and already started initiating plans to do that. Do you know if um, DYCD collects demographic data on LGBTQ youth? Do they ask questions upon admission to a program like other than California would definitely, you know, it's an LGBT basically um, center, um, but do other DYCD funded programs collect that data? Well, I mean, I could only speak for um, California Center and Streetworks because those are the two, uh, which is Safe Horizon, those are the two programs that I was actively involved in. And for those two programs, they did collect like demographic information, like intake. And then also, I think within the transition of houses, like if you're moving from emergency to transitional independent living, a reintake is done, so any information that may have changed um, six months ago is always updated. Okay, thank you. Can I ask you some of the so those same questions? Yes. Sure, so how did you find out about services and where did you go? Upon coming to the United States, I did my research, and so that's how I also knew about the asylum process. Um, I, was, I already had a visitor's visa and I was looking for like places to go to, and I. I guess I decided that it would be easier to come here since I was already like 
I already had a visa. Um, and I just Googled LGBT spaces and centers and programs. Um, and so I made a list of those. And when I arrived, contacted and called those agencies. And uh, have you heard of the New York City Unity Project prior to that? Um, when I came, so this was in 2016. So the Unity Project wasn't a thing as yet, but I am featured in the Unity Project. I am one of the ambassadors. You're also one of the ambassadors. OK, good. Uh, and. Um, and uh, you feel other youth are, are you taking advantage of that? I, I think it's available um, and the, like, it's a hub for resources, but I also feel like maybe because of limited access to the internet or um, just, I guess, an absence of navigation tool to that or referral tools to that specific website, um, it's not being used at, at its full capacity. Um, last week in our prevention meeting with the deputy mayor's office and the homeless task force, which Cole is um, spearheading, we did speak about an app that might be somewhat um, accessible, because it's on your smartphone that would have those information that a young person can easily access. So do you know any um, youth who go to um, Covenant House? I know of, yes. There are do, do you know if Covenant House does any demographic screenings? Not sure. Oh. Um, and they're DYCD funded, I believe, also. So, all right, th I'm just trying to get at because part of the issue for me as a legislator is trying to get these agencies to do that demographic data collection, and it's been a bit of a struggle, and that's why I was asking these questions. So, thank you both for coming in. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, and I wanted to say thank you. Uh, Councilmember Drum asked some of the questions that I wanted to get a sense of as well uh, on how how you're interacting with the city, nonprofits. Many of these nonprofits get a lot of support from the city. Uh, and so it just gives us a sense of the ecosystem that we have to build to really allow for not just access, but for capacity, to make sure that people have that capacity. And we heard from the door that they need more capacity, not just at detention, uh, with cases uh, that bring us detention, um, uh, clients who are in detention, but also uh, folks that are, are just trying to learn what options that they might have. Uh, and, and so thank you for, for your courage today to be out here and speaking your truth. And um, we, have, we have a few openly gay members of the council here, including myself and, and Councilmember Drum, and we're just really proud that hopefully one day you can join us on this side. Uh, move these questions and, and policies and funding questions forward. And uh, I can't wait to help you do that one day. I hope you can consider that. It would be an honor. Definitely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you. For, your, uh, for your testimony today. Thank you. Thank you. And so we have next uh, the administration uh, and the multiple agencies that are here today. Uh, so if we can call up DYCD and the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, who will be testifying. Oh, and HRA. So we have uh, the Assistant Commissioner for the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs, Kavita uh, uh, Sanchez, pa Paria Sanchez. Uh, we have uh, from DYCD, Kathleen Almansar. We also have the DYCD Assistant Commissioner, Randy Scott. And then the, from the Human Resources Administration, Jordan Dressler. Is there anyone else that's gonna come? I'm um, Ash McGovern from the Unity Project. One more time. Ash McGovern from the Unity Project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. And Jordan, did you want to join the group? Q&A. You got it. Thank you. Okay. So take it away um, after we swear you in. Great. Would you raise your right hands, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today? Please state your names for the record. Kavita Pauria Sanchez. Ash McGovern. Randy Scott. Kathleen Almanzar. Who would like to begin? To begin? Yeah. We have straws. <laughs> <laughs> we'll begin. DYCD will begin. Make sure you speak closely into the mic and when you're ready. All right. All right. 
Good morning, Chair Rose and Chair Manchaka and the members of the committees on, the, on youth services and immigration. I am Randy A. Scott, Assistant Commissioner for Vulnerable and Special Needs Youth at the New York City Department of Youth and Community Development. And I am joined by Kathleen Almazar, Senior Director of DYCD's Literacy and Immigrant Services. Thank you for inviting DYCD to testify today. Intro number 480 requires DYCD to submit a comprehensive plan to provide services for runaway and homeless youth programs, participants who may be deemed eligible for special immigrant juvenile status or immi other immigrant immigration benefits, and to report annually on progress towards that goal. Special immigrant juvenile status is a classification available to undocumented immig immigrants under the age of 21 who have been abused, neglected, or abandoned by one or both parents and are dependent on the family court. Obtaining this status allows an immigrant youth to obtain permanent legal residency and provides a path to citizenship. DYCD is strongly in favor of connecting participants to appropriate supports. As part of the contract to provide runaway and homeless youth services, providers are funded to assist young people to meet their needs in all basic areas, education, careers, health, mental health, and including basic life needs, such as acquiring identification and including helping them navigate their rights. DYCD funded RHY programs currently refer participants to organizations including RHY contractors such as The Door, Rising Ground Legal Services, Covenant House Legal Services, Project Hospitalities El Centro, Single Stop, and other groups such as the Urban Justice Center and Legal Aid Society. Service providers are required to make appropriate referrals for legal services, including immigration legal services. Providers make case referrals to nonprofit legal service providers across the city, or in some cases refer internally in their in-house legal services teams. DYCD's goal is to make sure participants are able to access immigration services, and we support the intent of intro number 480. Through the Human Resource Administration, the city contracts with immigration legal service providers, and we will explore additional ways to connect our participants with these providers as appropriate. It appears that the process outlined in intro number 480 is modeled on the process used by the New York City Administration for Children's Services for children in foster care. There are important differences between ACS and DYCD that would affect implementation of the process outlined in intro 480. For youth in the care and custody of ACS, the agency's access to important documents such as a youth birth certificate and case history can help with the identification referral for in immigration legal services. Additionally, an active family court proceeding is a prerequisite for SIG relief, which applies to ACS-involved youth, but not necessarily to DYCD's population. For both agencies, it can be challenging to obtain information about the outcome of a case because youth have the legal right to a confidential attorney-client relationship. Given the unique characteristics of DYCD's runaway and homeless youth population, we'd like to work with the council on amending the bill. Our providers work to build trust with the participants who share sensitive information on a voluntary basis. And we do not want participants to worry that receiving services obligates them to disclose immigration status. We also do not want to expose the participants to any unnecessary risk that could result from, a, from maintaining records about immigration status, particularly since immigration status is not relevant to eligibility for DYCD funded RHY services. I will now discuss the oversight topic, LGBTQ, you, LGBTQ immigrant youth in New York City. DYCD supports New York City youth and their families by funding a wide range of high quality youth and community development programs, including after, -scare programs, after school programs, community centers, literacy programs, and youth workforce development. We require that all of our programs are fully open and welcoming to both LGBTQ individuals. Oh, <laughs> I thought you were talking to me. <laughs> this administration has made unprecedented investments of over 20 million to keep young people safe and sheltered. By 2019, we will have since 2014 tripled the number of beds available to runaway and homeless youth in this city. 
We are on target to have 753 beds open in fiscal year 19 for youth up to the age of 21. And we have released a request for proposal to serve young adults ages 21 to 24. New resources from the Unity Project have supported the expansion of the 24-hour drop-in centers, and we expect to have one 24-hour center open in each borough this fall. DYCD is the administrative agency for the Interagency Coordinate Council on Youth, ICC, and the LGBTQ work group. I have been the co-chair of this work group since 2011. Through the ICC, DYCD has offered trainings with many partners for both agency staff and providers to increase their ability to work effectively and sensitively with the LGBTQ population. The work group meets monthly and consists of 15 members representing city agencies and the provider community. Through ongoing efforts to strengthen our site monitoring practices and investment in capacity building services, DYCD staff and providers are focused on ensuring that LGBTQ youth who are overrepresented in, in the RHY population have positive and welcome experiences in our programs. DYCD regularly evaluates programs to determine whether they are inclusive, welcoming, and respectful environments that embrace the diversity of all participants. Serving Im immigrants is an integral part of the work of DYCD. We fund programs for immigrants that assist participants with accessing government benefits, application assistance, including assistance with matters relating to citizenship and immigration status, employment, health care, social services, and civic classes in preparation for citizenship. Our Comprehensive Services for Immigrant Families program help identify the complex and multiple needs of newly arrived immigrant families with limited English proficiency and in collaboration with a network of community-based providers connects them to relevant services that will help them prosper and become self-sufficient. The goal is for each enrolled family to build self-advocacy skills and gain the knowledge to enable them to address specific challenges and navigate key systems that impact their lives, such as the education, healthcare, housing, benefits, tax, workplace, and legal and immigration systems. Beyond immigrant services programs, we are mindful that New York City is a city of immigrants and work to ensure that all of our programs are accessible to immigrants and their families. Our funding model acknowledges that community-based organizations and their staff are best equipped to meet the culture and language needs of a community. When applying for a contract with DYCD, all community-based providers must describe how they will work within the local communities and understand their specific cultural and linguistic needs. To support this, DYCD translates many of our outreach documents into 11 languages. Once a contract is underway, our evaluation criteria reflect these requirements. DYCD's contracts require meeting enrollment and attendance targets that cannot be achieved without engaging parents and young people in a linguistically and culturally competent manner. Through our capacity building department, we offer technical assistance and trainings to providers. Training topics have included supporting English language learners, sexual orientation and gender identity, and working with LGBT and gender non-conforming youth. The Heatrick Martin Institute has a multi-year contract with DYCD to develop a self-assessment tool to help other youth-oriented community organizations to address the specialized needs of LGBTQ youth, particularly transgender youth, including providing inclusive and welcoming environments. Our Youth Connect hotline is available to connect New Yorkers to our funded services through 311 or 1-800-246-4646. Youth Connect specialists help callers learn more about DYCD funded, pro funded programs and find program sites in their neighborhood. When we identify callers that need interpretation assistance, we connect them to the language bank operators who have the ability to speak up to 180 different languages. We have also targeted our outreach in advertising to immigrant communities. In fiscal year 18, DYCD placed ads in community newspapers promoting our funded services including Shelters for Youth and the Youth Connect Hotline. The advertisements, advertisements ran in Spanish, Arabic, Bengali, Urdu, Chinese, Haitian Creole, Polish, and Russian. In July, we promoted our Youth Connect Hotline and our funded services on the Link NYC kiosk around the city. 
The success of our programs is dependent on being able to reach New Yorkers most in need of our services, and we are committed to reaching out to traditionally underserved communities. After you hear from my colleagues at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs and the Unity Project, I will be happy to answer your questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we're gonna actually take a pause before the rest of the panel uh, to bring in some very specific DYCD questions from Councilmember Drum. Thank you, Chair. I have to go to a budget negotiating team meeting, so that's why I asked for you uh, to indulge me in this. I'm curious about how you go about uh, collecting demographic data and how much data do you currently have? Um, you know, I passed my law about a year and a half or so ago, and I'm wondering how the implementation of that is going. In, in relation to our runaway and homeless youth programs or yes, DYC and in LGBT general? LGBT youth specifically. Okay. How you're identifying them, what the questionnaire looks like, mm -hmm. what the response has been, and um, how are all uh, contracting agencies using it? Currently, DYCD um, does not collect data on, because um, we're not the direct provider. So you're violating the law. No, we're not violating the law. We're not yes, the direct. Yes, you are, because that law was supposed to be in effect over but six months ago. Let me just finish ex the um, answer to the question. Um, DYCD is not the direct provider of service. We contract out to our provider agencies who are the ones that collect. So how do, you, how do you, if you don't collect demographic data, how do you provide services? All the other stuff is nonsense. No, I'm just saying, in terms of the data that's collected, it's not within our system. But what we, data we, do you have? All right. For fiscal year 18, in fiscal year 18, but 25% 20, of the youth um, were in our crisis that identified as LGBTQ, and 26 in the till. Transition and, identified and, as LGBTQ. And where are you serving those? Where, where, where is that data coming from? The data is coming from our contracted providers. And what does the questionnaire look like for that? It basically asks the, if it's a voluntary information where the provider, um, the youth, volunteers the information. Have you so seen the, the questionnaire? Which questionnaire are you referring uh, to? On LGBT youth. We have... We have an intake form that our providers have that ask questions with relation, which basically allows for the youth to voluntarily identify. So it's not a questionnaire that comes and says, sits in front of a person and asks, are you LGBTQ? If the youth identifies as LGBTQ, then the um, provider will then identify that information and provide the necessary services that the youth de deems as needing. And every contracting agency is using that form? I can share a little bit of information um, about, I think you're referring to Local Law 126 to 128. Mm -hmm. um, so the Mayor's Office of Operations um, has been overseeing the implementation. I'm sorry, this. I can't hear you. Um, the Mayor's Office of Operations has been overseeing the implementation of this set of laws. Um, and my understanding is that they've made tremendous progress. Um, the it, there's a portion that has rolled out um, through some of HRA's programs online, um, and then paper surveys are being rolled out this fall um, across more of the programs. Um, but we can get you more of an update from. No, the I Mayor's know, Office and I've been in touch operations. with the director of the Mayor's Office of Operations, the new director. I was unfortunately uh, received a terrible response, and I believe it was from DYCD as well, about the rollout of the implementation of the law and the time that it's taken to implement this law. And I think that you would agree that it has been problematic, right? Um, I think it has been more complicated than we anticipated to roll out. So pro problematic. Um, and, and, and you have not abided by the, uh, the law itself because I believe that that data was supposed to already being collected. I actually can't speak to that. Yeah, I know. All right, so this is a big issue for me. And so I don't know how you provide services without data collection. And so uh, it, it doesn't make sense to me anymore to even further question without being able to talk about data and statistics. Um, every other service uh, in the city is based on that type of data collection. I don't understand what the administration is doing. I really don't. Thank you, Chair. I'm sorry. Thank you, Councilmember Drum, and, and really, I, I just want to echo that sentiment that we are we are in a um, an unfortunate situation here, not just from the kind of execution, the city's execution that is complicated, and, and we we understand that we get it, 
Um, but what's unacceptable is that we haven't yet arrived at the place that we need to to really understand how we provide not just the data but the actual policies uh, and services that can connect to a vulnerable population that feel often, and you heard it today, that they are forgotten, not just from the advocates but from them themselves. Uh, and so this is not only concerning but I think something needs to happen and we're hoping that we hear that today. We didn't hear that today. I don't know if you want to, I want to respond, but I want to make sure that all the other agencies that are going to be reporting report as well. With, with respect to the contracted providers that we have, we, as I mentioned in my um, testimony, is the expectation that they provide all services um, that, are, that a youth identifies, and legal services are part of that. And within legal services, immigration could, status could come up as a, a, a need. Right, so it is a. We expect that our contracted providers then work with the necessary agencies, whether it's HRA who has a contracts now, whether it's um, internal serv legal services that they have, to make sure that they sit down and um, provide that information. Now, of the information that we received back from um, our contracted providers in fiscal year 18, of those who immigrant youth, it was 97 youth, right? Of those youth who were referred to SIG services, 75, right? And of, um, and of those youth who are potentially SIG eligible, 23. So these are the um, numbers that have been reported back to us in regards to fiscal year 18, last reporting period, from our providers. So our providers are doing great, uh, great work in terms of communicating the legal um, services that they can represent youth on and making sure that they have the um, the representation to go out there and do so. So it's, I don't want it to be seen as it's not being collected. We know that our providers are doing a great job in terms of um, making sure that youth have the ability to go internally and state what their concerns are and get the necessary assistance in order to identify that, whether it's legal services, whether it's around criminal justice, whether it's around immigration, or whether it's around mental health, whether it's around education, or whether it's around employment they have these abilities at the contracted sites. So I just want to make sure that that's represented. Councilmember Drum? Well, I would argue a little differently and say that without data, we don't know what we're doing. Okay, and that's why collecting data is so vitally important, especially in this era, in this age, there's no excuse for not having this type of data, especially because now that it's the law, it should have been done. But let me just give you an example of what it is that I'm talking about. When I first started uh, the, the hearing here today, I mentioned a student who had come in to um, see me and uh, he was applying for asylum, only recognized that he was LGBT within the framework of a year from between he was 16 and 17. Matter of fact, it was in Council Member Holden's district where this, um, this youth lived. Um, but, um, you know, had um, he not been directed in the right way, or had it not been discussed with, at some point about him being LGBT, that's what made him eligible for, um, for, for the asylum case. So that's why the collection of this data is so vitally important because oftentimes if you don't ask that demographic data, those questions, you're not gonna get to the type of relief, immigration relief that is possible. You know, so if these kids, some of them, were to be sent back, and there have been cases of youth who have been sent back to their countries who have been killed because of their LGBT status, okay? So that's why I'm so insistent on this piece of it. And I, and I do look forward to continuing to work with the administration, with the Mayor's Office of Operations, to get this all straightened out. Um, I, I met with her three months or two or three months ago. We need to really move on this because it's long overdue. I want to ask a very specific question about the provider's data that are, are brought to DYCD specifically, and um, are, are, do you ask them for data, or do they give you the data that they want to give you? What, what, is that, uh, what is that expectation between the city and the providers? Well, when we are in need of um, statistical data from the, the providers, then we can go and request the data from them for whatever service that we need. So, we so this is ad hoc. So this, is, this isn't necessarily policy that you say, Here, here's the framework. This is what we need to know as, 
as a city of New York, mm -hmm. multi-agency approach. Mm -hmm. You're saying just kind of go and kind of pick. Oh, we want to no. see here. We want to see here. So well, help there, us understand what 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 you mean. There are five key indicators that um, we currently focus um, services on. The key indicators are housing, employment, education, um, mental health, and basic life skills. So monthly our providers report back on those indicators in order to share with us the steps that they have taken to provide services to youth in those key indicators. So that's how we um, get our information. We currently use a Capricorn system um, which tracks that information but we are building a new participant tracking system in order to give not only internal but our external providers um, a more user-friendly um, system in order to input information, create reports so that they can use it at their disposal and we can use it as well. And that, that system, is that new? Is that, is that, is that, that's a new system, that'll be a new system that you create. What's the timeline for that system and is that connected at all to the local laws we mentioned earlier? The timeline is, is still pending because we're currently building the system now. We are um, doing many, many different focus groups, we're working with the providers to make sure that it's something that works with them. Um, we're also you know, testing it out, so we hope that within the soon, I don't have an exact time frame right now in order to tell you about the participant tracking system, but we are using the Capricorn system, which is online. And in terms of the contracts with the providers, are, is any of this information gathering uh, request request for data in the contracts themselves? Yes, it is. And how is that how is that described? How is it described in the contracts? That basically is it specific. This is the kind of data we want. Well, it's, it speaks it, to our RFPs are um, speak to all the requirements that are necessary. So we speak to what they need to have in terms of linkages, in terms of completing putting information in our database system, whether it's Capricorn or a, a new system that's being built. So I don't have that language in front of me now, but I can always get it, get it to you. Um, thank you. Stay where you are. <laughs> we want to go to anyone else that's going to testify today, and then we can continue the conversation. So I just wanted to make sure that Councilmember Drum had the opportunity. So this is Bill. We support him in that vision. Anyone else testifying today? Please. Thank you. Um, thank you to Speaker Johnson, Chairs Chaka and Rose, and the members of the Committees on Immigration and Youth Services for convening this hearing. My name is Kavita Pauria Sanchez, and I'm the Assistant Commissioner at the Mayor's Office of Immigrant Affairs. Today's hearing is about immigrant youth, an area Moya is particularly proud to work on. In fact, our commissioner has just returned from a week volunteering her legal services to detained immigrant youth and separated families in a federal detention center in Texas, which is why she is not here currently. My testimony will provide an overview of the work Moya has done under the leadership of Mayor de Blasio to support immigrant New Yorkers and in particular, LGBTQ immigrant youth. I'm very proud to report that Moya has conducted unprecedented outreach efforts to reach and provide support to immigrant youth across the city, including by providing information about resources for LGBTQ immigrant youth. First, I would like to briefly address Intro 480. The de Blasio administration has made a historic investment of more than $30 million on immigration legal services, alongside the largest ever investments from the city council. In line with our broader goal of expanding access to legal services, we applaud the goal of Intro 480 of ensuring that the city's runaway and homeless youth are connected to these services. We are particularly gratified that the bill seeks, in effect, to expand on our existing agency-based immigration legal services programs for immigrant youth through Moya's Action NYC in Schools program. We look forward to working with the council to ensure that our city continues to effectively connect vulnerable immigrant populations to services and benefits. Turning to the topic of LGBTQ immigrant youth in particular, New York City is home to approximately 3.1 million immigrants. Over 150,000 are under 18. 
and of this number, we estimate that approximately a third are undocumented. While there is no reliable data on the number of immigrant youth who identify as LGBTQ, we know that New York City has one of the largest LGBTQ populations in the country, including many teenagers and young adults. LGBTQ youth have unique needs and challenges as we've heard today, and we know from our work with community members and advocates that young people who identify as LGBTQ and lack immigration status may face even more obstacles in accessing legal and social services, greater rates of discrimination, and other unique issues related to the intersection of their immigration status and gender identity or, and or sexuality. Moya has undertaken truly unprecedented outreach work to reach immigrant youth over the past several years. To provide a snapshot, just since the beginning of 2017, Moya conducted a total of 513 Know Your Rights workshops in schools and colleges, reaching over 12,000 students and family members. These school setting Know Your Rights workshops inform immigrant youth about their legal rights and how to access city resources, such as IDNYC and Action NYC, and they help youth connect to information about affordable housing, fraud prevention, and support for victims of discrimination, including information about gender and sexuality-based discrimination. In addition, late last year, Moya participated in the Gender and Sexual Sexuality Alliance Summit for LGBTQ Immigrants in the DOE system, the GSA, including running a workshop and interactions with local law enforcement and ICE and opportunities for youth activism. One of our largest efforts to support immigrant youth has been through our ongoing citywide work on DACA. Through this work, we have reached thousands of immigrants, both directly and through public education, and have directed them to legal services as well as other resources, including information on LGBTQ health specialists and gender and sexuality-based discrimination help. Though DACA remains under threat from the Trump administration, Moya has continued to provide information via Know Your Rights workshops and targeted days of action to ensure that immigrant New Yorkers are up to date on the latest developments. Importantly, we know that DACA has represented a powerful opportunity for LGBTQ immigrant youth, many of whom have tremendously benefited from the ability to gain work authorization and health insurance, among other benefits. We've had the pr privilege to meet and work with incredibly talented and courageous DACA youth who have been very public about the intersectionality of their identities as both immigrant and LGBTQ New Yorkers. Moya has also conducted efforts and events to reach the broader LGBTQ immigrant population, including both youth and adults. For example, as part of our 2016 Immigrant Her Heritage Week, Moya hosted a successful roundtable in Jackson Heights on the needs of LGBTQ immigrants with participation from a number of different LGBTQ community groups. And just last month, we took part in a roundtable organized in partnership with a Russian-speaking LGBTQ group, CCHR, CAU, and Thrive NYC to discuss discrimination, homophobia, and other challenges faced by Russian-speaking LGBTQ communities, including recently arrived immigrants. Through this outreach, we seek to build stronger relationships with immigrant communities throughout the city and support greater access and inclusion. More specifically, on Moya and interagency initiatives, Moya's outreach to immigrant youth about immigration legal services is most focused at their schools as these are often safe and familiar settings for young people who may be wary of seeking services elsewhere. In the last school year, Action NYC and schools provided immigration legal services at 30 schools. This program has also facilitated access for immigrant youth for other necessary services and benefits. Moya has participated in targeted IDNYC outreach to immigrant students as well. Recently, we worked with IDNYC to lower the minimum eligibility age from 14 to 10, expanding access to identification 
for hundreds of thousands of youth. This eligibility change paired with applicants' ability to self-designate or omit their gender on their card provides a younger population of LGBTQ New Yorkers, regardless of immigration status, with the ab ability to obtain not only their first ID, but also an ID that empowers them to identify th themselves in the way they choose. Moya and IDNYC have begun this school year with great energy and enthusiasm for promoting IDNYC to an even larger number of young New Yorkers. We also know that mental health is a concern for many immigrants and that it is especially true for LGBTQ immigrants and youth who often experience stigma and barriers to accessing health care. Moya has collaborated with Thrive NYC to improve outreach and messaging for immigrant communities and effectively connect them to health, mental health support via the New York City Well hotline. To conclude, I want to recognize the incredible collaborative efforts of Moya's partners sitting on this panel, as well as other colleagues across the administration who have been critical in the work of supporting youth and LGBTQ New Yorkers. We look forward to continuing this conversation on LGBTQ immigrant youth with the council. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Assistant Commissioner. And I, I want to just start off by asking a few questions. Uh, uh, and actually, I'm going to go and ask the first question. I, the the commissioner isn't here today, uh, testifying for us. Uh, where where is Commissioner Vita Mustafi right now? Sure. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, she just returned from a week volunteering her legal services to um, to separated children and parents um, in Texas. Um, literally just returned, as I think you know, um, and she is currently at a um, press conference speaking to the issue. And the reason she could not attend this hearing in particular um, is since she was away all of last week, um, she was not able to have the time that she wanted to um, in order to prepare for today. Um, so I am equipped um, to answer all of your questions, I hope, and happy to be here. Awesome. What, uh, what is she announcing today? She's, she's at a press conference. Tell us sure. a little bit about what is happening at this press conference. Sure. Um, so she is. Um, t will, she'll be speaking in particular on the experience of the city volunteer legal group um, that just went down to Texas. This was a city trip that she went on. Yes. Paid for by the city of New York. No, it was paid for um, by private dollars, um, and. Uh, relied on city staff volunteering their time, um, and the city staff who volunteered their time were lawyers or social workers. So it's a report back of her of her time in Texas. Yes, that is one part of it, and the okay. second part of it is a four point one million dollar dedication um, from the administration to immigration legal services for um, unaccompanied minors in particular. The same topic that we're having a discussion about today. Um, yes and no, right? Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um, so the overall population of UACs um, is something like 1,500 in New York City at any given time. That number varies. Um, the number of children that remain in the city as a result of the recent tri crisis created by the president um, is around 40. Um, and the the subsection the subsector of that larger UAC number um, in terms of LGBTQ youth is extremely small um, and so there's yes that absolutely you are correct there is overlap um, but the broader pool that we're, we're that she is speaking to today um, is 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 broader and not not specific in the way that today's hearing is. I'm not going to belabor the points that were made earlier, but I just want to link it up to this idea of, of uh, insinuation about the LGBT community being part. Uh, we're, still, we're still struggling to understand how many because the data isn't there. So I just want to note that, that a statement like that has to be qualified with a sense of we're still struggling to understand how many uh, because of the lack of information. And so tell us a little bit more. Again, I'm not going to belabor that. That's just pointing to a point that was made earlier today at this hearing. Um, the, the administration made a $30 million investment in immigration legal services. Uh, and can you give us a sense of the breakdown of that $30 million? Sure. And actually, um, I 
think it would be best if I referred to Jordan Dressler on the breakdown. Wonderful. Yeah, if you can just pull up a seat, uh, we can we can have you, and we need to swear you in as well. Yeah, of course. Hi. Uh, would you raise your right hand, please? Do you affirm to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth in your testimony today? Yes, I do. Thank you. Can you state your name for the record? Sure. Jordan Dressler, uh, Civil Justice Coordinator with HRA's Office of Civil Justice. Uh, good morning, and good morning, Chair. Nice to see you. Yep, so just uh, we like a great a sense of, I mean, I have a series of questions, but let's just start with a $30 million investment uh, and that breakdown. Sure. Okay. I think it's important to put it into context. Um, in fiscal 19, uh, the administration is dedicating approximately over $30 million to immigration legal services uh, covering a spectrum of uh, needs, ranging from and I don't have the specific number, and I'm under oath, so I'm going to say somewhere in the neighborhood of uh, maybe seven, seven to eight million for the Action NYC. One program. more time. I'm sorry, seven to eight million, I believe. Seven to eight million for Action NYC. Um, again, I don't have that number in front of me, and I want to be as precise as I can be. That is as precise as I can be. Uh, that is providing uh, access to free, safe, and uh, uh, qualified uh, immigration legal screenings and uh, legal representation in straightforward matters to thousands of New Yorkers every year. Um, a large portion, uh, roughly 19.6 million, which is roughly the balance there, is now part of our IOI program, uh, the Immigration uh, Opportunities Initiative. This is a program that was uh, established uh, in partnership with the City Council several years ago. Uh, at the time, the notion was that the administration as a baseline contractor needed to develop a flexible and nimble approach to immigration opportunities for immigrant New Yorkers to take advantage of hopefully positive changes in the law, things like DACA, things like DAPA at the time. Uh, Things have changed, and we now have a very flexible and nimble approach to meeting the needs that are created by inhumane policies by the Trump administration. Uh, that is uh, included in there is a large uh, portion, I, I don't have the specific number today, but for, uh, dedicated for one of the most acute needs, which is deportation defense. It's also included there, and that's been included since, uh, I want to say, fiscal 17, is uh, starting with $2.7 million in funding dedicated for complex legal matters. Uh, I have to acknowledge the leadership of the City Council here and the Chair in advocating for that funding, in pushing that forward, and in uh, working with us to create those partnerships with legal providers to meet those needs. Those complex legal matters, and it has grown from there, uh, from the, two, the initial 2.7 in terms of what's allocated for so-called uh, complex legal work, uh, includes matters like SIG, includes matters like asylum. Uh, and last year, um, we uh, threw, uh, I'm sorry, an additional 2.1 million uh, is dedicated, that's uh, funding through the community service block grants that uh, Ms. Stotland of the door referenced earlier. Uh, f uh, roughly 500,000 of which is specifically dedicated for uh, immigrant youth in New York City, both uh, in foster care and out of foster care. Um, we're happy that the door is one of our providers uh, doing that work. Um, put all that together and it's roughly 30 million. Uh, that uh, program is, w that's where we are now. Last year, uh, administration funded programs served uh, immigrant New York is in approximately 15,000 cases. Those are legal cases that you're referencing to? Legal cases. In, in yes. variety forms, whatever, 15,000. Roughly 15,000. Okay. I do want to say that approximately 16% of those, over 2,000 of those, uh, involved youth uh, age 21 or younger. Uh, we were able to uh, uh, make those findings and they were part of our annual report uh, last year. Okay, I want to get specific on some, some pieces that are related to this hearing today which is really thinking about the portion of that 30 million that are going to specific LGBT-related casework uh, outreach services from this 30 million. What portion of that is going to LGBT 
popul LGBTQ population? There's no specific designation for particular populations. By the same token, there is no, obviously, limitation on where those resources uh, will go. What, what our approach has been is to rely on providers to and give them the kind of flexibility both in terms of the size of the contracts and the flexibility within contracts so that they can meet the needs where they are, focus their energies, and also have a variety of providers. Some providers who might uh, be working specifically with survivors of domestic or intimate partner violence, some providers who are working with immigrant youth here in New York City. So what exactly is preventing you as a city agency, uh, as a city with contracts to give specific LGBT related services? What's preventing you from doing that? I'm not sure anything is preventing, but I'm not sure that's the approach that we're taking at the moment. Right. We want to be responsive to all needs. Got it. Okay. So there's nothing preventing you from doing that, but the, the, the kind of I, decision, I, the policy decision is to resource uh, the organizations that you mentioned, the door and others, to do that kind of work, given them, given that, give them that flexibility to have, to serve the population. Uh, we haven't looked at the legal or contracting issues around that specific question, so I don't want to commit to one position or another on that. But I will say the approach that you just described, being flexible, contracting with a variety of different kinds of contractors, meeting different geographic communities, different demographic communities, is the approach that we've taken so far. Got it. And then that we'll, we'll, I think, want to have more conversations about that afterward and think about what, what options we have and, and make some decisions sure. together on that. I think what's interesting too though is that what you did hear from the door, and we're gonna hear from other eye care providers that are specifically focused in this population, is that the capacity uh, to do this is higher than the funding that, that gives them that opportunity to serve. Can you respond to that, that I, sentiment? I can, I think, the, I think the situation is more complicated than that. Um, Help us understand. Sure, I, I think there are a number of dynamics at play right now, and one of them is a variety of needs, all of which are emergent. Uh, we are doing our best to keep up and make use of a flexible system that we've put into place to uh, enlist a host of providers to meet a variety of needs. There are concrete limitations on expansion that go beyond simple, simple funding. They start with space. I'm aware of at least one provider who was unable to take additional funding for fiscal year 19 because of a lack of space to place an employee. Fortunately, we were able to uh, work with that provider, uh, if not to add a lawyer, to add a social worker to deal with the acute needs faced by immigrant youth. Uh, that's positive, but at, with the level of expansion that we've seen, and I just wanna place that in the account, in fiscal year 2013, administration funding was $2.1 million for Immigration Legal Services. Fast forward to fiscal year 2019, and we're at $30 million, over $30 million. In addition to that, we must acknowledge, and we're happy to acknowledge, the dedication that the City Council has shown in the same areas for the same providers, meeting needs like deportation defense for detained immigrants, including programs like eye care that we are happy to be supplementing the, uh, to meet that representation gap there. There are concrete limitations in terms of the number of lawyers around who are qualified to do this complicated work. The space, the office space, other sort of so-called OTPS expenses. This is all stuff that we're exploring with the providers to make sure that we are expanding in the right ways, in the right areas, and doing so thoughtfully. And when were you made avail or, or when were you made aware of these issues that you just explained to me now? When did that become apparent for the administration? The, 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 the knowledge that you just it's came, part or of the conclusion that you just... The dialogue that we, it's a continuing dialogue with the providers and the legal services community. When did that become come aware? I just want to get a sense about when that information came in. Uh, is there a time when that happened? Did, did you know this in 2013? No. Did you no, know this no. in 2014? No. But I'm asking the, but about when you became aware that this was not just a, let's put more money out there, when you just gave that graph of funding that has moved from 2013, not this administration, council, or mayor, 2013, to now we have seen an expansion of money. When did you become aware that this was not just a money issue, that this was a more complicated issue? 
When did you become aware of that complicated nature of this issue? This issue is complicated across all civil legal services programs that have been expanded, and I've been in this position since 2016? 2016. So uh, you couldn't have come, become aware of this before 2016. I'm, I, I can't commit. I can't commit. This is not a pati particular fact where there was a point before Look, which I, I knew. I, we I can just, talk later. Yeah. I, what I'm saying is that as soon as we become aware of the multiple and complicated nature of this issue, and I'm also aware of the issues that you just p point out, we have to respond. And so I'm trying to get a sense about how we respond in total to this larger need of immigration services. Today we're speaking about the LGBTQ community that continues to get forgotten in discussions. That is how we opened up this hearing. And I'm asking all of you to think about this. When we think about larger complicated issues, people get left behind in discussion. And this Venn diagram, this moment where we're, we're seeing LGBTQ and, and undocumented immigrants get, get left behind because we're trying to do the right thing. And that's, that's why I'm asking about the planning that the city has marshaled something to get this going so that we don't leave that this population behind. Right. That's that's my question. You might not be able to answer it today, but that's a question that we need to we need to answer. Um, I think what I think the the announcement that I think we're all just hearing about today uh, talks about this four point one million dollar allocation. So help us understand we're at a great opportunity right now. We're at a public hearing. Uh, I think we were invited to go. Uh, this is the work that we are doing. Um, and so tell us a little bit about this $4 million for unaccompanied immigrant youth and deportation proceedings. Was this your process in coming up with the $4 million? Did you engage eye care providers as you made this decision? Yes. Help us walk through that, that discussion, the process. Yes. Yes. This was, uh, the answer is yes to all tell those me, Tell us about it. Part of our dialogue with our IOI providers and the legal services community generally was identifying needs and also identifying capacity and abilities on the part of the providers to grow. Uh, these were uh, areas that the providers said they could do the work, they could marshal the resources, both staff and otherwise, to meet the needs. Uh, and uh, we were able to earmark uh, money within the larger $30 million allocation that the de Blasio administration already committed to immigration legal services. So this generally. is part of the 30 million? Yes. So you're reallocating something that was already allocated for this, for we're, this need? We're dedicated, we're, but this is not, this is, this is in, in, in the spirit of growth. It's not at the expense of other things. Okay, and, and you, were, you approached eye care providers about the announcement today? Yes, they are recipients they're aware. of the funding. They're, and they're, they're more the than process. aware, they're recipients of the, of the funding. And in, in this well process, did you include the city council in any way in this in this decision making process? I I think. I mean, I can say no for myself. Uh, I was not unaware, but I don't know. Maybe you you asked any somebody other some other members of the council. I can't, I can't speak to discussions that may have happened. Okay. I wasn't part so of. So that'd be great to follow up on sure. to see how yeah. you are engaging yeah. in partnership with the city council on this funding that the city council approved, uh, and want to continue working in partnership with you. And so tell us a little bit about the breakdown in the providers that you've identified for this funding. They're all part of the IOI uh, consortia that are under contract with the with. And the who city. are those providers that will be contracting and the amounts are uh, c that are connected to the $4 million? I don't have the breakdown of amounts, but I can tell you that the providers include, uh, and this is a non-exhaustive list because it's over a dozen providers. Uh, uh, can you door? give us those, that list? I beg your pardon? Can you give us that list? Well, I don't have the list. We would probably be best following up and providing the comprehensive list. So you don't have the list, but you're announcing, an, an, you're announcing something today without a list of providers? I don't if have If you can the email list, someone, I can wait. I have a couple other questions, so if you can get that to us, that, that'd be great in real time. We will get it to you. Awesome. So let, I'll just keep going down the questions sure. and we can come back to that, that question. Uh, if someone on your staff can get that, that'd be really helpful. Um, and is this a one-year commitment for the $4 million? The money is baseline. Say that again? The money is baseline. Mr. Chair, I, have, I do have the list. Wonderful. Please share. Catholic Charities, Catholic Migration Services, Central American Legal Assistance, Immigration Justice Corps, Kids in Needs of Defense, Legal Services NYC, New York Legal Assistance Group, Northern Manhattan Center for Immigrant Rights, Safe Passage Project, Sanctuary for Families, The Door, the Legal Aid Society, Urban Justice Center, 
uh, Bronx Defenders, Brooklyn Defender Services, and Make the Road New York are all IOI providers doing work on behalf of uh, as uh, migrant youth facing deportation. And what you don't have right now, as I understand, is the amounts associated with each of these organizations. But each of these organizations know that they're part of this, uh, this new initiative that you're announcing today. Each of these organizations know that they are providing legal, legal services for migrant youth facing removal. And how much of these dollars are going to social services and case management? Uh, we'll get back to you, but it is a not insignificant portion. We did specifically designate funding uh, as part of this uh, at the request of providers to not just support straight up legal staff, but also the kind of case management and social work staff needed to meet the acute needs of migrant youth, many of whom have been traumatized. Got it, but this is all going to providers. So none of this is going back into Action, Action NYC. This is all for legal service providers and um, well, this is baseline. Yes, I'm sorry. Yes, and baseline, and and back to the question of the LGBT community. Are are, and I you 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 um, I like to get that sheet if you can with all the lists because it is a long list. Are any of these dedicated to the LGBT community, LGBTQ community in any way? Any of these are beyond the door? I I heard the door. Are are any of those LGBT? I think Q every provider on that list is providing services to the LGBTQI community. Okay. That's fair. Uh, okay. I am going to pause here and hand it over to uh, Chair Rose. And uh, I have a quick vote that I'm going to go do in land use, and I'm going to come back. And um, I think. I think what I want to say, I don't know if, I'm gonna, uh, if you'll be here by the time I get back, but so many of the questions that we have for Moya, and I hope that the chair can kind of go through, through them while I'm gone, um, really speak to this, to this lack of, of opportunity that we, we leave at the table to engage each other and focus on vulnerable communities. And today's conversation is a really important one, the LGBTQ immigrant undocumented community. And they deserve every ounce of respect. And I, I know that each and every one of you do, are doing incredible work. That does not assume, we cannot assume because we're doing good work that we're doing it in the best way. And so I really want to make sure that we, we adhere to that promise of public service to our, to our community. Um, and again, thank you for your work. But um, we, we are seeing lack of, of, of opportunities that we don't take to partner up. And, and I hope that we can change that. Uh, in a very real way. And so I'm, I'm going to hand it over to, the, to Chair Rose while I go vote, and I'll be right back. Um, I also wanted to mention, Council Member, um, that the director of the Unity Project is also here to deliver testimony. We didn't want you to miss that um, if you do have a moment. Yes. No, I'll just have another testimony if you do. Oh, you do? Yes. Oh, please. yes. So please do so. Wonderful. Um, good morning, Chair Rose, Chairman Chaka, and members of the Committees on Youth Services and Immigration. My name is Ash McGovern, and I'm the director of the NYC Unity Project, New York City's first coordinated citywide initiative to support and empower LGBTQ young people through innovative policy and program change. I thank you for the opportunity to testify today about the needs of LGBTQ immigrant youth communities and the relevant services we provide as a city. As you know, the de Blasio administ administration has been and continues to be a champion of LGBTQ equality and justice. In June of 2016, New York City became the first municipality to launch a citywide campaign specifically affirming the rights of transgender individuals to use a bathroom consistent with their gender identity or expression. In March 2016, Mayor de Blasio issued an executive order requiring city agencies to ensure that employees and members of the public are given equal access to city single-sex facilities without being required to show identification, medical documentation, or any other form or proof of verification of identity. And in, 20, in December 2015, the New York City Commission on Human Rights issued legal, legal enforcement guidance defining specific gender identity protections under the city human rights law, including equal bathroom access, as well as access to housing, employment, public accommodations, and other protections. And of course, in September 2017, the administration launched the New York City Unity Project. And these are just some of the commitments of the de Blasio administration. The Unity Project was created to strengthen and expand upon the administration's LGBTQ justice commitments with a focus on meeting the needs of our most vulnerable and marginalized LGBTQ youth, 
including LGBTQ immigrant youth. In May of this year, the Unity Project announced an unprecedented $9.5 million commitment over the next three years to address key issues that directly and disproportionately impact LGBTQ immigrant young people. First, to address the incredibly high rates of LGBTQ youth homelessness broadly, we committed funding to expand three youth drop-in centers to 24-7 service in partnership with DYCD to ensure that for the first time there will be a 24-hour drop-in center in every borough where young people can seek services, get connected to case managers, build community, and have a safe place to go when they have nowhere else to turn. We also committed funds to create the city's first DYCD shelter serving young people aged 21 to 24, an initiative made possible by city council's leadership on addressing youth homelessness. Second, to address the issue of family rejection among LGBTQ young people, which is a key contributor, contributor to inequity across multiple areas, we invested in a package of programs to help families develop better tools to support and aff affirm the LGBTQ young people in their lives. In partnership with ACS and the Ackerman Institute's Gender and Families Project, we are expanding training for parents and caregivers to support their LGBTQ young people. We have also created a first-of-its-kind clinical training program in partnership with the Ackerman Institute specifically aimed at training clinicians of color from geographically diverse neighborhoods in New York to support family acceptance in their clinical work. In partnership with the LGBT Center, we are expanding a successful family acceptance clinical training program called Project LIFT, which provides training to clinicians working with ACS-involved families. And in partnership with CAMBA Project Ally, we committed funds to create bilingual Spanish-speaking family support services for families of LGBTQ Latinx youth in central Brooklyn. Finally, recognizing the needs of LGBTQ, care, uh, LGBTQ foster care youth, disparities in health equity, and the need to ensure our policies and programs are youth-driven. We have also committed funds to the first ever confidential foster youth care population survey, which will include questions about sexual orientation, gender identity, and gender expression. We funded a youth-led participatory action research project, which will help identify youth-driven goals and priorities for LGBTQ family acceptance work moving forward. And we've also committed funding in partnership with DOHMH, for two new prep for adolescents clinical sites in Harlem and Central, Central Brooklyn, where LGBTQ young people are more likely to seek services and HIV transmission rates are high. The Unity Project is committed to centering the needs of the most vulnerable and marginalized LGBTQ young people in our city, and that absolutely includes addressing the needs of LGBTQ immigrant young people. We are committed to continuing this work in partnership with City Council, and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I'm not going to be redundant. Um, I apologize for my uh, lateness. I had uh, um, sort of a strange event happening in my district this morning, um, so I I was late. But I, I so I won't um, try to be redundant. But there are some um, questions that I'd, I'd like to ask. Uh, and if you've answered them before, please um, bear with me. But um, in terms of the Unity Project, um, how, ma how many, you, you talk about funds that you committed to, um, to bilingual Spanish-speaking family support services. Is that only in central Brooklyn? And um, if so, are you, um, thinking about considering, you know, expanding language access um, pro, um, plan in compliance with Local Law 30? Yeah, so um, CAMBA Project Ally, is they're based in Central Brooklyn, but they also have marketing campaign that goes throughout the city, a Spanish-speaking marketing campaign focused on acceptance for um, family members of LGBTQ young people. You say throughout the city? Mm -hmm. and, so they, and what does that mean? Does that mean that they, there are actually sites no. in each of the five boroughs? No. Or? So there's no. outreach across the city. There's a marketing campaign across the city, essentially featuring family members um, of like parents who have LGBTQ young people, Spanish-speaking marketing campaign that's a, launching across the city but the actual parent facilitator who will be a Spanish-speaking facilitator is only in central Brooklyn. So it's no. a centralized location yes. 
so um, young people and families in the outer boroughs would have to travel to this location? Currently for that program, although there are other programs that I mentioned, like with the Ackerman Institute, that are based in Manhattan. Um, are there plans to expand that program, that specific program, to the other boroughs? Not that I know of currently, but that would be great. So how many people are served through that, that centralized program? Yeah, so they, I have to, I'll send you specific numbers, but approximately, so it's, in that project, there, there are parent peer-to-peer -peer support groups, um, but then there's also family training, so like peer-to-peer -peer family training that's not necessarily just like a weekly support group. Um, and I believe last year they served around, uh, I want to get you the exact number, but several hundred. Um, do you think that um, it's, it's adequate, that it's, it's actually um, able to meet the need, the need that is out there? This one program or the yeah, well, package? This, this particular um, program, um, which is a, a language access program, right? Yeah, it, it's funds to hire, to specifically hire a Spanish-speaking um, facilitator for the family support groups. So with your um, affiliation with the other um, providers that you have, mm -hmm. um, all of them have, have Spanish speaking or whatever language mm -hmm. um, faculty, staff to man these programs? Uh, so, I'm assuming you're asking about the family acceptance program specifically. Um, oh, I'm, I'm talking about language access plan right. that it, you know that fits into compliance with local law 30. Mm -hmm. Are all of the the projects, all of the service providers you are affiliated with, mm -hmm. are they in compliance with this um, with local law 30? I would have to get back to you on specifics, and I can't speak to that. Okay. Um, and do you conduct um, um, anonymous surveys um, so that there's some way to collect the data that we're, um, we're asking for? Mm -hmm. So we do, I mean, the Unity Project has really been sort of a coordinated effort across agencies. So many of the agencies that we work with collect data, many of the partner organizations that we work with collect data. What we have done is a lot of outreach to community-based organizations and young people themselves to ask about their experiences and really say, you know, what do you want out of the Unity Project? What do you want us to be funding? What do you want us to prioritize? Um, so we don't collect uh, data in the tr sort of numerical traditional sense, but we have absolutely gone out to communities and community members and asked them what they want and documented those concerns. Do you share that information and data? And with whom? Uh, I have not shared that information um, with others other than those who work directly with the Unity Project. Um, so we have some agency partners that we've talked about anecdotally, but not in any formal way. And does the Unity Project coordinate with Moya and DYCD on programming for LGBTQ immigrant youth? And you know, has there been measurable results from that coordination? We certainly work with Moya and DYCD, um, and part of what we funded in May was a, a partnership with DYCD, shelter beds, and also drop-in center services. Um, so we're absolutely in close communication and partner regularly, yes. Moya, I want to ask you, um, is, um, are you satisfied with the level of interagency um, coordination and collegiality to address the the needs of this population, and um, and if you are, um, how are, are are there any efforts to to capsulize this so that um, the city council would know um, about the results, the success, and what the the further needs are? Sure. Um, 
am I satisfied? You know, I think there's always more we can do, and this is an issue that um, we, you know, I, I've actually been working on LGBTQ issues um, for immigrants for over a decade, um, and in that time, I've seen tremendous progress, um, both on the side of the, um, the, the community and the organizations that are out there doing tremendous work, um, as well as on the part of the administration. Um, and, you know, Moya works day to day as part of our fabric um, with DYCD, with ACS, with DSS, with the Department of Health, with the Unity Project, um, with the Commission on Human Rights um, to unpack these issues and think in particular about. Um, how, how do you get to this particular community? Um, what are the, the effective outreach tactics? Um, where, what are the uh, partners we should be working with on the on outside of government um, to make sure that we're, we're reaching everyone? Um, and then in terms of the how we measure results and um, share them with council, um, so I, I'll speak a little bit to Local Law 186, um, which re which is new, requires Moya to submit an annual report every year. Um, we submitted our first one um, this past March, um, and that report, um, I think, uh, we hope does that job of encapsulating um, our partnerships and some of the more salient um, results of our work. It does not capture everything um, because our interagency work is just part of the day-to-day -day operations. Um, and not everything makes it into a report, um, but that is, I think, um, a, a very solid starting point for this year, and um, there, there will be more um, in, in years to come. Do you have a formalized mechanism to uh, collect that da that data from all of your um, your partner agencies? Which data? Um, the data regarding LGBT um, immigrant youth. Um, we. It has been a challenge, absolutely, and I think earlier in this hearing, um, we spoke about the demographic data bills, um, which I know that Mayor's Office of Operations in partnership with all of the impacted agencies and my office um, has been working hard to implement, and I think that will make a difference to the extent that um, it's possible in that the demographic information that's collected through that survey is voluntary. Um, much of it will only apply to new applicants, um, and I think it has tremendous potential, particularly through the DOE, um, in that all students will receive it, um, but I do, I do think that will start to provide us with um, a better picture um, of this population and all of the ways that the city is actually touching um, these communities through you know, just I think over dozens of programs, um, but that is difficult to kind of surface through through the data at the time. And and does Moya actually conduct an um, anonymized survey? Um, and could the survey gather information that would inform programming for this specific uh, population? Moya does not, um, but we are not required to under the under the law. Um, it is the it is um, a whole host of other um, social service agencies primarily that are um, required to do so. I can provide. So that you list just compile that. information from the other agencies for um, the the report that you produce. Yes. There is a report, right? Yes, there, there is a report. There's supposed to be a report. There's a Moya the annual report okay. um, on immigrant issues. Um, we compile information from agencies and we um, provide information on our partnerships, um, on programs, initiatives, how we respond to ad hoc issues. Specifically, um, there is data specifically uh, um, collected for LGBT immigrant youth. There is some, um, but it does not cover every single program or service at this time. So who should we be looking to to try to provide uh, this data, this mm -hmm. data? Yep. Um, so again, we did get into this earlier in the hearing. Um, 
and the Mayor's Office of Operations is overseeing the implementation of these demographic data bills, or laws now. Um, and so I think we'd be happy to follow up with more information about the implementation schedule. Okay, and has, has the Moya Task Force discussed the needs and service gaps facing LGBTQ immigrant youth? Um, Sure. Yeah. Um, so okay. the task force was um, formally formed um, by Local Law 185 late last year. Um, and we recently met um, in August with 23 agencies from across the administration who um, either were mandated to attend the task, um, to be a part of the task force or um, that we determined were critical um, in addressing the needs of immigrant New Yorkers in the city. So there's um, about, I think it's 11 mandated agencies that are a part of the task force and then 12 additional ones um, that have been added, such as the commission. Specifically with DYCD? Yes, DYCD is a part of the task force. Um, so our first meeting um, was inaugural. It happened in August. Um, we, co we covered a breadth of issues, um, as you can imagine, under um, in this current political federal climate. Um, there are uh, just a huge amount of issues that we are grappling with as a city um, from agency to agency and as Moya, of course. Um, and so we did not discuss LGBTQ issues at the first meeting um, in August, um, but we do plan to, um, to, to discuss this issue and are in the process of currently mapping out our focus and priority issues. Um, and so we, we do imagine doing so. And who is the DYCD um, representative on the task force? At the first meeting, um, the the person who attended from DYCD was um, a, I think, Deputy Commissioner San Sandy Gutierrez. Correct. So, and, and you are going to meet. It's not that you've met already specifically with DYCD. You're you're planning to meet to discuss this specifically? We are happy to do so. Um, we talk to DYCD about a number of issues facing immigrant youth um, regularly, um, and we'll be doing so separately as well as through the task force. And in your um, 2018 annual report, the SIJS applications mentioned um, appear to have been entirely filed through Action NYC programming, has Moya considered deploying Action NYC at DYCD events and programs? Um, Action NYC in schools um, primarily operates at um, school locations, over 30 across the city that have been identified as having um, a high immigrant population um, based on a language proxy, since we don't actually collect um, immigration status at the DOE. Um, so the focus really has been the schools. Um, could we explore partnering with DYCD? Absolutely, um, at, at local and community events. Um, and if the committee, um, um, if it, uh, the committee's understanding that Action NYC no longer focuses on one type of relief, but rather conducts comprehensive immigrant screenings, do you find that this has impacted the number of youth, um, the number of eligible youth for immigration relief, you know, that are reached? Sure. Um, so I can, at this time, I can only speak to the SIG portion of that. Um, and if I look at the numbers over the last two calendar years, at least, the numbers have actually gone up um, of the number of SIG cases that we've been doing out of Action NYC. Um, and, and then there are all of the other city-funded legal services programs that also um, conduct that work. So I don't have specifics on immigrant youth for the entire city, um, but I do know that within Action NYC, the number of SIG cases has increased over the last year. Um, it's, it's the committee's understanding that, you know, DYCD no longer provided, um, you know, this specific programming for DACA. Um, recipients and DACA eligible youth, and so it was transferred. Um, can you tell us why? 
Chair, I can, I can respond to that. Uh, Jordan Dressler, uh, Civil Justice Coordinator, Office of Civil Justice. Um, the legal services programs that previously were housed at DYCD as well as other civil legal services programs that lived in other agencies uh, were consolidated in, I believe, 2016 um, and came to the Human Resources Administration, uh, roughly coinciding with the time that the City Council uh, created and uh, the mayor enacted the law to uh, create the Office of Civil Justice, which is the office that I head up. So at this point, all civil legal services programs in the city uh, are at OCJ, which is at the Human Resources Administration, uh, where we contract for, monitor, and oversee legal services programs, including immigration legal services programs. Um, uh, uh, just to follow up on what the Deputy Commissioner uh, just said, um, in terms of uh, cases involving immigrant youth, uh, last year, uh, last fiscal year, um, uh, across administration-funded city uh, legal services programs for immigrants, that being Action NYC, um, the IOI program, as well as uh, CSBG, uh, Community Service Block Grant Funded Legal Services, uh, roughly 2,200 cases uh, involved uh, immigrant youth 21 or younger. Within that group, uh, there were specific cases involving uh, a number of SIGE cases as well as DACA, and those cases alone numbered uh, roughly 1,700 for the year. And that, um, and that information was ascertained through DACA statistics? That's right. ascertained directly through the legal services providers legal services. Um, who uh, are reporting anonymized, uh, not identified information about the cases that they handle uh, to uh, my office as well as to uh, Moya in the case of Action NYC on a regular basis and they were made part of our uh, OCJ annual report which was released this spring. Um, and does DYCD um, prepare, also have a prepared plan for language access under Local Law 30? Yes, the YCD has a plan. Um, we, um, most of our uh, intake forms for participants have been translated into 11 languages. We also, the only direct service that the DYCD actually has at this moment is the um, Youth Connect uh, line where we have the, uh, we use the language, uh, language line uh, contract where we uh, have over 180 different languages available when people call in for information. Um, uh, then, um, if so, why wasn't it included in the, um, in the Local Law 30 report? I'm not sure. I'm not sure. I it, yeah, it wasn't included. Right. Right. So, like I said, the only direct service that DYC has is the, uh, the language, uh, the uh, information line that we have. So we don't provide direct services. So therefore, we are not really included in that, but we do follow. So we do provide our providers with, you know, intake forms that have been translated. So that's a form that the, the participants need to fill out in order to register for DYCD programs. So we since our like i said our programs are not direct services we it's the it's the providers that provide the direct services so are you you're saying that you're exempt from local law 30 the one for local law 30 the one aspect that is required the one direct service that we for have language access yes that is the it, we use that through the 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 line we were in compliance when we were audited by the a comptroller's office. Mm -hmm. I mean, if that's helpful. You were compliant where if you weren't a part of this report? The on, like, uh, so the only service that we provide directly, that we come directly in contact with, a, with someone from the public is through our, our Youth Connect line. So therefore, with that, we provide the services. If someone needs uh, to speak to someone in, in a different language, we provide that. I can touch so on what you're saying. You don't have to report that out. Is that what you're saying? Um, 
essentially. Um, so the local law, the scope of local law 30 is agencies that provide direct services to the public. Mm -hmm. um, so brick and mortar within, let's say, a DYCD office um, directly interacting with the public. And since they do not um, do that for the most part um, outside of that one telephone hotline um, is my understanding, Youth Connect, um, they, they um, follow the law. Um, and I think have done a tremendous job doing so, um, but what, there was not enough information that required, um, that elevated it to the point of including it in the overall city's local law 30 report. However, I think I get where um, you're coming from, which is what about the providers um, that are funded by DYCD? Um, and I think, um, the progress on Local Law 30 has been um, fantastic in terms of all of the city agencies that had to gear up very quickly to add a number of languages to hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of forms, um, but it's been a work in progress. Um, and my sense is that phase two will really need to, fo phase two of implementation will really need to focus on providers. Um, so, and that's a conversation that my office together with the Mayor's Office of Operations will be having with all of the impacted agencies, um, including DYCD, but, but way beyond, um, given the number of providers that the city contracts with. Okay, so this is something that you would consider and, and um, will be a part of the discussion yes, going forward. absolutely. What we currently also do is in, in all of our RFPs, we make sure that we include language that when the providers are um, responding to an RFP that they have to demonstrate how they're going to be culturally, linguistically, you know, competent and how they're going to meet the needs of the target population that they describe in their proposals. So, you know, a lot of times our CBOs already have the language capacity at their, at their offices and we've also seen that our providers have changed staffing patterns to meet the changing needs of their neighborhoods also. And how are we addressing this in our um, TILs and our runaway homeless youth programs? How, how are we addressing this? One of the key components of um, contracting is that there is a case management um, you know, component to services that are being de delivered. So youth that are in um, these programs, whether it's the drop-ins, whether it's our crisis services, which are our short-term residential programs, or our transition independent living facilities, which are the longer-term residential programs, they must have key staff, case management staff, um, who are able to address these issues or make the necessary referrals for youth that um, come into their care for any legal services. Um, as was mentioned in um, the testimony earlier, some of our programs have some legal services within, embedded within the um, overall organizations, and if they do not, then they refer out to those organizations that they can receive necessary um, assistance. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you. Um, council member, do you have any questions? <laughs> thank you. So then, um, I know uh, Chair Menchaca wanted to have one more bite at you guys, but um, uh, we're going to have to move um, move on. Um, if any of you can stay, please do so. Uh, I know you're looking forward to more questioning, um, but uh, with that, I, I want to thank you, and um, we'll call the next panel. Um, Jamie, I'm sorry. Did you say? Oh. Jamie Paulovich from Coalition for Homeless Youth, Teresa Moser from Legal Aid Society, Laura Berger from Brooklyn Defender Services, Jeffrey Colt from Covenant House, and Princess Masulungan. Let me try that again. Masilangan, um, please uh, come forward. This is the last panel. Okay. Yeah, oh, okay. So. Okay. Okay. We don't have to stay. Here, right? 
Okay, um, you can begin. Good morning. My name is Jamie Polovich, and I'm the executive director of the Coalition for Homeless Youth, also known as the Empire State Coalition of Youth and Family Services. The Coalition for Homeless Youth has advocated for the needs of runaway and homeless youth across New York State for 40 years. I would like to thank Chair Rose and Chairman Chaka and the members of the Youth Services and Immigration Committees for holding today's hearing. I would also like to thank Council Member Drum and Ayala for introducing the legislation being discussed today. We applaud Council for their efforts to ensure the immigration needs of runaway and homeless youth are being supported during a time when our federal administration has displayed a bigoted stance towards immigrant and LGBTQ populations, including youth with new immigration directives that jeopardize their safety and are a violation of their human rights. In my written testimony, I go into an overview of the runaway and homeless youth population in New York City, but I'm gonna skip that part for the sake of time and jump right into our comments regarding intro 480. The Coalition for Homeless Youth supports intro 480, which would require DYCD to create and implement a comprehensive plan to provide services to runaway and homeless youth who are eligible for special immigration juvenile status. However, based on feedback from our members and the experiences of homeless youth themselves, we would like to highlight some challenges that exist and recommendations co the coalition has regarding ensuring youth experiencing homelessness get the immigration supports they need. They are as follow follows. First, comprehensive immigration screening. Undocumented runaway and homeless youth who seek services from DYCD funded programs each have their own unique story, which may or may not include experiences that could qualify them for several different immigration supports. This bill focuses heavily on referring youth for support with special immigration juvenile status applications. However, not all homeless youth qualify for SIDG for a variety of reasons which are outlined below. And many providers have reported seeing more success in pursuing T and U visas for runaway and homeless youth which are available to trafficking victims and victims of other crimes. Therefore, the coalition recommends that runaway and homeless youth in DYCD funded programs who identify as needing support with their immigration status should be referred for a comprehensive immigration screening with someone who is qualified to conduct such an assessment to ensure that they are exploring all appropriate avenues. In addition, once an appropriate resource has been identified, the process, including all requirements and potential timelines, should be explained to the youth so that they can make the final determination about whether or not to proceed and or prepare themselves for any part of the process that could be triggering, such as having to contact estranged family members or having to talk about traumatic experiences in detail. Number two, specifically regarding the SIG applications, as stated above, this bill focuses heavily on referring youth for support with special immigration juvenile status applications, which we assume is because it was written to mirror local law six of 2010, which requires ACS to provide increased immigration related supports related to SIG for children with child welfare involvement. However, it does not take into account that unlike youth in ACS care, runaway and homeless youth receiving services in DYC funded programs are doing so voluntarily and DYCD does not have custody of youth in their programs. Our members report that a major barrier to runaway and homeless youth being able to complete the SIG application process is that they are unable to identify an adult to act as their legal guardian, which is a requirement of the application. Secondly, if a runaway and homeless youth is able to identify a guardian that is willing to sign up on the application, notification must be made to their current legal guardian before the new individual can take over the role, which Sky spoke to earlier. Youth report that this notification poses two issues. First, a majority of runaway and homeless youth that have left home were kicked out due to abuse or neglect, and the thought of having to re-engage with those individuals, especially for the purpose of notifying them that they are pursuing a new guardian can be extremely triggering and traumatic. And two, many youth who are in need of immigration services do not have guardians who reside in the United States. Therefore, to successfully complete the notification, the paperwork must be sent internationally, which can cause delays in the process. We recognize that the real solutions to these issues 
are outside of the control of city council, but what we do recommend is that there be a clear expectation that service providers support you through this process and provide therapeutic supports to address issues that may arise when reconnecting with guardians, which could be triggering or cause new trauma. Third, regarding funding, which other folks have spoken to as well, Although the coalition fully supports meeting the needs of runaway and homeless youth in need of immigration supports, we feel that it is important to note that there are very few legal resources that exist that have experience in working with the runaway and homeless youth population, and therefore are sensitive to their unique needs and situations. Currently, there are only two runaway and homeless youth agencies that have legal services on site, both of which have very limited capacity to process applications at the rate needed. Similarly, there are only a few additional legal supports that RHY agencies can refer to that have this unique experience, and they too are often at capacity and have long wait lists. Given the current political climate, we recommend that funding for legal immigration services be increased as soon as possible through programs such as the Human Resources Administration Immigrant Opportunities Initiative. And number four, regarding the training requirement, the Coalition for Homeless Youth is pleased that this bill includes requirements around training for the providers to help identify and support runaway, the runaway and homeless youth they serve and recommend that the training be mandatory and be conducted by a qualified training provider who can offer the training multiple times per year to account for changes to immigration laws and staff turnover. Again, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you. I tried to be quick. <laughs> Very good. Yes, you can start. Uh, uh, say your name, please, and your organization. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Teresa Moser. I am a staff attorney in the Juvenile Rights Practice of the Legal Aid Society. Uh, the Legal Aid Society would like to thank Chair Rose of the Youth Services Committee, Chairman Chaka of the Immigration Committee, Council Member Drom and all the other members of the committee for holding this hearing today and given, giving us the opportunity to, prevent, uh, to present testimony. Um, just for a little bit of background, uh, the Legal Aid Society um, presented testimony back in 2009 and 2010 when the council considered Local Law 6 of 2010. Um, and we were happy to provide our input then and also to work with ACS following the enactment of that law. Um, at the time, there was a real crisis in, um, uh, among the population of children who were in ACS custody in that many, many of them were eligible for special immigrant juvenile status, but ACS was not identifying those children in time. And so because there is an age out provision, or there was at the time, for special immigrant juvenile status, many youth would age out of foster care or and or eligibility for special immigrant juvenile status before ACS or any of the foster care agencies that they work with um, provided the necessary immigration legal services. Um, after the passage of that law, we did see a radical change um, and we're happy to report that many more young people in ACS care and who come into contact with ACS in other ways um, did receive, do and did and do receive necessary immigration benefits through the help of immigration legal services providers. Um, and that is really critical. Um, because we saw the effectiveness of that plan and how it worked in the past, we are heartened by the fact that the council is um, uh, looking at a bill that would have also required DYCD to come up with a similar plan. Um, we would point out, though, as others have, that the runaway and homeless youth population is different from the population that comes into contact um, with the Administration for Children's Services, although um, they do have many similarities. Um, I, I would echo Eve Stotland's remarks earlier about um, what is really uh, an attack on special immigrant juvenile status by the current administration and the U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, and that um, because of the current climate, the landscape for special immigrant juvenile status is becoming much more uncertain really day by day. Um, but even putting that aside, it's a much more challenging proposition for uh, a young person who is involved in the runaway and homeless youth system to qualify for special immigrant juvenile status because they don't have the same uh, 
connection with family court that, children, that many children um, in ACS care do. Um, and so, um, as other people have mentioned, if you can't um, receive necessary findings from a family court judge, then you're not able to apply for special immigrant juvenile status and you're not eligible. Um, but um, critically important is that there are other immigration benefits that may be available to runaway and homeless youth. Um, and that, and that is um, why we think that the plan should not be focused so much on special immigrant juvenile status, but really should focus on all immigration benefits that um, young people should be uh, referred for qualified immigration legal services that will, will, that will be able to help young people identify what benefits they may be eligible for and to navigate the immigration system, which has, as has been mentioned earlier, is extremely complicated. Um, it's also important to recognize that um, not only is the system complicated, but there are um, risks to making oneself known to the immigration system, especially in today's climate. And so that makes um, competent immigration legal services even more important so that um, a young person has uh, qualified assistance in evaluating not only what benefits they may be eligible for, but also what the risks are of going forward with any immigration benefit and figuring out what the appropriate timing is for those things. Um, because of, oh, I just want to make one point also about um, LGBTQ immigrant youth who um, are homeless, and that is that and I should preface this by saying I am not an immigration law expert, um, but based on what knowledge I have of the immigration law, I would say that while um, because of their experiences, both as members of the LGBT commun LGBTQ communities and also as homeless young people, um, it may be that immigrant LGBTQ homeless young people have uh, a greater uh, likelihood that they may be eligible for certain immigration benefits. It is, I don't think it is the case that one's status as a member of the LGBTQ community qualifies one for asylum or any other particular immigration benefit. And that this is why it is so critically, another reason why it is so crit critically important that these young people are provided with competent immigration legal services providers who can help them figure out based on all of their experiences um, as immigrant youth, homeless youth, LGBTQ youth, what um, immigration benefits they may qualify for. Um, so to that, uh, I also echo that um, DYCD really should hold the responsibility of ensuring that all runaway and homeless youth have access to immigration le legal services regardless of which um, RHY provider they may be working with throughout our city. Um, I think two providers um, who specialize in working with runaway and homeless youth and also do the immigration legal services, um, the Peter Chikino Youth Project of Urban Justice and the door were both mentioned and I think that um, some RHY providers have stronger relationships with those immigration legal services providers or others than other RHY providers do. And so I think that it behooves uh, DYCD to ensure that all of the providers across the system um, are receiving appropriate training to identify young people who may be in need of immigration services um, and also to be able to make those referrals in a timely way. Um, finally, I just wanted to mention one, that one other thing, which is that um, the bill talks about assistance with um, securing birth could certificates. You, could you wrap up your testimony? Yes. Thank you. Uh, so um, with assistance with birth certificates, it can be costly and time consuming. And I think that the RHY providers um, don't generally have the resources to do that. So that DYCD should uh, be working with Moya and uh, potentially ACS, which may already have relationships with some of the consulates to help young people from other countries secure their birth certificates. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't mean to be short, but um, we have to vacate this room by one o'clock. So I, I want to hear from all of you because you all have something important to say. So 
please um, make your remarks so that everyone can um, be heard. Thank you. Um, my name is Laura Berger, and I'm a staff attorney in the Immigration Unit at Brooklyn Defender Services. Our youth and communities team has represented thousands of Brooklynites in their applications for lawful immigration status, including 220 young people's applications for SIG. Um, and we specialize in, most, in the most complex cases representing young people in, in Brooklyn who have criminal court involvement or whose parents have ACS involvement. And I want to thank the City Council Committee on Immigration and the Committee on Youth Services for this opportunity to testify on um, Intro 480 2018. Um, in spite of the important protections for immigrants passed by this council, um, immigrant, immigrant youth without citizenship in New York City, particularly immigrant youth of color, homeless and LGBTQ immigrant youth are at constant risk of ICE detection, <laughs> partially because many activities that are unavoidable for homeless, a homeless person are criminalized, such as being in a park after closing, sleeping on the subway or public urination, and for homeless, undocumented young people, these arrests can also put them on ICE's radar. Our homeless clients report difficulty accessing RHY youth services. Currently, there's only 28 beds for youth in Brooklyn and no beds for youth who do not identify as LGBTQ. To better support these youth, the principal goal is the city should be providing more safe shelter and respite centers for RHY youth, a runaway homeless youth in Brooklyn. And we support the efforts behind Intro 480 to uh, ensure that all eligible young people obtain essential immigration services, but we believe the bill takes the wrong approach. We have specific concerns about the issue of confidentiality as information is shared between RHY service providers, DYCD, and the council. Um, additionally, monitoring and reporting on case outcomes can be difficult as five years may pass before a, a child who's introduced to their immigration lawyer until they receive permanent residence through SIG due to the long wait list for children from certain countries. Um, runaway and homeless youth may stay in transitional center independent living programs for up to 24 months, but the average young person only stays in a crisis shelter for 21 days. Um, I'd also like to echo my fellow service providers on the current issues with special immigrant juvenile status before immigration and the need for comprehensive legal screening. Um, in our written testimony, we outline a number of ways we believe would be better to provide essential services to LGBT immigrant, runaway, and homeless youth in New York. And we respectfully request an opportunity to engage with council staff in the future, other service providers, and stakeholders to make sure all young people are connected to the services they need. Thank you. Good afternoon. I just want to let you know I have my written testimony right here. It's undistributed if you need a copy afterward. My name is Jeffrey Colton. I'm the senior supervising attorney at Covenant House in our legal department, where we serve runaway and homeless youth age 16 to 24. I'd like to thank the Committee on Youth Services and the Committee on Immigration, in particular the respective chairs, um, Deborah Rose and Carlos Menchaca. Covenant House New York, CHNY, is the nation's largest nonprofit adolescent care agency serving homeless, runaway, and trafficked youth. And during this past year alone, CHNY served over 1,900 people in our residential programs, as well as through our drop-in center and street outreach efforts. And on a nightly basis, we provide shelter to approximately 200 young people, including pregnant women, mothers with children, LGBTQ youth who make up a disproportionate number of homeless youth, immigrant youth, and trafficking youth. Our youth are primarily of color, and over a third of our youth have spent time in the foster care system. We provide youth with food, shelter, clothing, medical care, mental health and substance abuse services, legal services, high school equivalency classes, and other educational programs and job training programs. Now, within the, the broader scope of CHNY exists our legal services department. And our department is different from almost every other legal service provider in the state because, as it was mentioned, we serve the legal needs of homeless youth right where they live, and there are only a couple providers that do that. I currently serve as the sole attorney at CHNY, despite having all of those clients. Not only do we serve our existing clients, we serve every youth who ever had any services with us are always welcome to come back to our legal services department and I provide direct representation, advice, referrals where possible if the resources are available on an array of issues, including name changes, especially for transgender and gender nonconforming youth. And I, I want to personally say thank you to the vote that was taken a couple days ago that will allow youth to keep from outing themselves, allowing gender X to be marked on their birth certificate. That goes hand in hand with moving forward. 
and protecting them. We help with their immigration, domestic violence, broken adoption, identity theft, and everything a homeless youth can experience, which brings me to homeless youth, immigration, LGBTQ issues, and SIDS. Young people in our care are first asked about their immigration status, by, both by the intake specialist and case manager. First, they're assured that their immigration status in no way will affect the services they receive at THNY. And if they um, lack legal immigration status and don't already have an attorney, they're referred to our legal department. Now, SIDGE, as everybody's pointed out, it is a critical form of relief that's designed for literally the most vulnerable of our population, children and youth, and it is under attack. If a youth chooses to pursue SIDGE relief and can identify a guardian, our legal department, which is me, would file the necessary paperwork in family court, submit the required USCIS forms, which put the youth on the road to stability. As Ms. Stotlin pointed out from the door, uh, and I think she was being generous when she said a case now takes twice as long, I think it takes significantly much longer. You are dealing with just an unbelievable array of rejections that are covered everything under the sun, and I know in the SIDS community, we're all sharing information, trying to figure out what are we supposed to do. Um, so, you know, I, previously at CHNY, and, and now we're becoming wary of telling the youth it's, it's okay to come out of the shadows because it's not okay anymore. And as they were talking about affirmative applications, meaning, meaning saying, I'm a SIDGE eligible person, to tell the government where you are, knowing what might happen, is devastating now. And for LGBTQ youth, it's particularly devastating because many have fled their homes from fear and prejudice, and now they're here. And we say, come out into the light, but it's no longer safe. So as was brought up by Ms. Moser from Legal Aid, new forms of immigration relief are, are central to this. It's not just about SIG anymore. And it's important, if they're not SIG eligible, what other forms of relief can we provide for them? And that takes time, and that takes legal resources. And that's why um, DYCD coming up with any kind of funding for, it, it, this takes money in lawyers. I, I'm a practitioner, I don't normally do this kind of thing. I'm a frontline lawyer. And that's what's needed right now, is creative, talented, um, hardworking, committed lawyers and funding to help deal with whatever, if you identify a youth, you now have to provide those services for them. And we believe that, you know, every RHY, the RHY system is doing all it can for now, but it has to do more. And we believe that every young person, every LGBTQ youth has the right and deserves to speak to a qualified lawyer, an attorney, to advise them of their choices and what decisions can be made. Every undocumented youth within the runaway and homeless youth system deserves to have that. And so because of that, along with creating a stat strategy and plan of action, additional funding for lawyers in the DYCD funded runaway and homeless youth programs by the city is crucial in addressing this problem. I'm sorry for speaking okay. so quickly. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Princess Masilungan, and I am a legal fellow at CARE New York. Um, and today, my oral testimony is just an excerpt of my written statement. Um, and first, thank you so much to Chairs Rose and to Chair Menchaca for calling today's hearing. So SIDGE is crucial for immigrant children because of the Trump administration's systematic closure of pathways to immigrant documentation. And intro 480 is necessary to preserve access to SIDGE as the Trump era continues to threaten and traumatize immigrant communities across the United States. CARE stands with all immigrant communities, including of course the communities of immigrants who identify as LGBTQ. And while the majority of Muslim Americans are not immigrants, those without legal status find themselves particularly targeted. From the three separate Muslim bans to the ongoing attempt to repeal DACA, these attacks have caused some undocumented Muslim youth to feel as if they are under a unique kind of siege, living under a government that can be as Islamophobic as it is often xenophobic. And that is a feeling that may, be, may become very aggravated um, for children who are struggling with issues related to their LGBTQ identity. Furthermore, leaks suggest that the Trump administration will expand public charge as a grounds for inadmissibility and block green card applicants to use any means-tested benefits, including those to secure food and medical care for their children, leaving again children of immigrants seeking green cards the most vulnerable. 
Intro 480's charge for the departments to identify homeless and runaway youth who qualify for SIG would also bring it back to its original purpose. In 1990, SIG was passed to provide humanitarian protection for abused, neglected, or abandoned immigrant children eligible for long-term foster care. In a complete recognition that the immigrant immigration system as it was did not have those same protections. Now, Mr. Trump's recent policy reversals move SIG away from that purpose, distorting it, reducing access to SIG. Less than a month after the reversal, USCIS denied applications from at least 81 formerly eligible applicants in New York City alone. This process was not just heartless, it was arbitrary, as shown when they denied the application of a previously eligible young Brooklynite while approving his younger sister's virtually identical application. In light of the confusion and inconsistencies that have resulted from the reversal, Intro 480 will give the department the power and the responsibility to ensure that the spirit behind SIG lives on by encouraging homeless and runaway youth and LGBTQ youth within that community to take advantage of SIG. We're hopeful that with the passage of Intro 480, this council's impact will reverberate even beyond those communities, inspiring young people generally not to exist in fear of a system that is seemingly against them, but to overcome. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, in your testimony, you, you restated that there are only two providers that's um, doing um, immigrant legal services, right? Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. Um, Our understanding is that there are only two runaway homeless youth providers right. contracted with DOCB that have on-site legal services. So there are Excellent. only two representatives from law firms and sister clubs, mm -hmm. but to our, knowledge only, sorry, to our knowledge, only the door and Covenant House have actual paid staff to support youth on site. And so um, uh, I believe from the testimony that we heard today, there's a need to have more legal immigrant services on site, right? Um, and so, um, our, and to your point, you were talking about that can only happen through additional funding, or is there, um, is there already a, a channel that's available that we just haven't accessed? for um, uh, legal services for runaway um, youth who are immigrant um, and LGBT? I may not specifically have the answer to exactly the, the funding for independent, for legal services within, for instance, an RHY. Um, I understand there are funds available through iCARES. Um, you can become a partner that way. Uh, but as far as DYCD and, and this initiative, uh, I think our approach is any reporting requirement should be accompanied by funding to service that very reporting requirement. Um, I, I'm not grant funded myself, as, or in, in, as far as I know. Um, I'm just, I'm the legal department and so I, I, I just provide direct services. But additional funding should accompany any kind of uh, reporting requirement or referral requirement because right now, as they were all saying, everybody's strapped and I take what I can take and I'm a family court expert and so normally I would do all of the SIG in family court. There's such a volume that it has to be referred out because there are all those other issues that all of our homeless youth are dealing with. It's just, it's not just the SIG issue. So a dedicated immigration attorney within all of the RHYs mm -hmm. is an unbelievable resource and, and that's something that should be explored. Okay. Um, have you seen a rise in civil immigration enforcement for this population? Deportation cases? A, a rise in civil, you know, enforcement? Or if not, have you seen a marked increase in criminal enforcement for this population that has secondary civil immigration consequences? 
I have um, clients who have uh, been caught up in ice sweeps um, outside of what would seem like just a, a ne normal criminal appearance, caught up in an ice sweep, and then they're in a New Jersey detention center, and that's it. Yeah, we're um, also seeing that um, because of a uh, recent executive order that went into effect on September 11th, um, now denied affirmative applications will automatically be referred to removal proceedings. That's a bigger risk for our clients and it makes them more reluctant to come forward with affirmative applications. And that's in contrast to uh, the previous administration where the majority of enforcement activity was targeted towards people who had um, criminal justice system involvement. Now we're talking about people, individuals who simply apply for a benefit and that's how they come to the attention of ICE and they end up being um, the subject of enforcement action trials. Okay, thank you. Where are there gaps in city funded or provided services for this specific population? Where are the gaps? I, th I think with the funding for lawyers, as Jeff was saying, but I think also young people need financial supports for other um, things as well. You know, a, a lot of times young people may have a green card or may have other documentation, but they just don't have the documentation anymore. I mean, have the status, but they don't have the documentation anymore. And so it's often a burden for our runaway homeless youth providers to pay the fees, you know, to replace a green card or to replace a permanent resident card um, that can be quite costly. And so I think also to expand the need for funding, the lawyers I think are first and foremost the most important funding need, but I think then also funding is needed to support young people in just obtaining documentation, whether it's around their immigration status or like Teresa was saying, you know, for birth certificates um, or other, you know, vital documents that they may need. There's been criticism um, from the advocates that the New York City Unity Project does not provide youth with the services that they truly need. Is this correct? And what are the gaps within the, that campaign? I, I don't have any information about that, specifically no. that issue. No. I mean, I, I think that the Unity Project um, is meeting a very unique need and something that wasn't happening before, right? They're put in place and being tasked with kind of assessing and providing support specifically to LGBTQ youth across systems in New York City. And so I'll, although I think that because it's new, there will always be room for improvement about how that is kind of being implemented, I think that it's important to note that everything that they've done is, is in addition, right? Like they're not taking away they're only adding and enhancing services that didn't um, previously exist. And um, uh, do you think that the collaboration with Moya um, is sufficient? Um, are there any recommendations that you could um, leave us with for how Moya could effectively interact with service providers, with the advocates, and um, to deliver and the city's agencies to deliver services to this population? At this point, I don't know, does Moya funds Action NYC? Is that my understanding, right? And I've- Is what? Moya funds Action NYC, which I think is a very important resource, and I heard the gentleman speaking on the funding for it, and, and that there was no actual specific allocation, but it was a general fund, it seemed, nothing targeted toward LGBTQ. Um, issues. One, I think the funding there needs to be increased. Uh, more and more, I'm forced to rely on Action NYC, which is good, but, uh, you know, the issue of RHY homelessness is they're there right, right there. I don't know where they're going to be in three weeks or four weeks because our goal is to find them shelter. And as one young person looked at me, uh, they missed their appointment, I said, what happened to you? And they said, I'm homeless. And that was it. That they, my, their legal issues are not the number one thing on their mind. And so having services inside the facilities, are, it's critical, I think, um, to deal with it. Uh, increased funding, uh, I think Moya, the, the budget for Action NYC should be increased immediately because that's becoming a, a default for a lot of us and it's working out very well. And just, I, I think, more direct coordination with RHY to make sure services are in place, especially with 480, to make sure that there are people to answer the call when we get it, that's critical. 
I want to thank you all for, um, for testifying today. And um, I want to thank uh, Council Member Menchaca uh, and Council Member Drum and Council Member Ayala for, um, for bringing this legislation. And um, this hearing is now closed. Thank, thank you. you. Oh, yeah. yeah. This meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>